Hello, fellow misfits. Are you ready to venture into the heart of darkness? Gather around the misfit campfire as we embark on a journey into the haunted realms of the great outdoors. From spine-chilling ghostly apparitions to mysterious creatures that defy explanation will bring you stories that will keep you on the edge of your seat. Thank you for your support. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that like button. And now... Story time. I can't tell you what I saw that day, but I can describe it. I lived in Skykomish, Washington for a couple years and was curious about Sasquatch. I've had a couple of experiences, but this was different. I was out for a walk with my dog one afternoon in the summer of 2018 and turned to see something watching us from behind an embankment. It looked like a tree stump. I stopped and stared at this thing for 30 seconds. It had owl-faced features, but it was huge. The head of it was sticking up from behind this embankment, and it was the size of an old-growth tree stump. I was close to this thing about 20 feet away. I could see its eyes were closed but squinting to observe me. It almost seemed sloth-like. It had designs that were a cross between bark lines and owl pattern marks. I felt no fear at all. I was staring at it and said, what the hell is that? My dog didn't notice it. After a bit I looked down and stepped forward without feeling threatened. When I looked back up it was missing. I stood there for a minute, then got spooked and went home. I walked back to that spot and stood there every day looking for whatever it might have been I saw that day. I walked behind the embankment one time and sized it up to be about 6 feet tall so whatever I saw was about 7 2 or 8 feet tall I estimate. There are lots of super eerie calls in the area. A lot of Sasquatch. I believe there are other undocumented creatures as well. I have some photos of odd things but did not have my camera on me that particular day. My aunt lives on a hill overlooking a city in Southern California. It usually takes about 15 minutes of dirt road driving and then a bit of off-roading to get there. Driving over rocks, through giant trees, and by a burnt-down Depression-era maintenance house, the view is spectacular. But it is isolated due to the difficulty and type of car required to get to the house. Situated above a Depression-era orange grove, it would be very difficult to get to this house without directions and help. My family simply refers to this as the hill due to the isolation and seclusion that accompanies being there at night. When you're there at night, you're staying there. There is no real getting down the hill at night. One winter night my aunt and uncle were watching TV when a knock came about on their front door. Not only was this completely strange, but nearly impossible due to the navigation required along with the winter cold. My uncle didn't bother locking his door due to the seclusion. Before my aunt could peek a look at the door, three men in all white were overlooking them. They asked is this the battered women's shelter? Unbeknownst to the intruders, my aunt's two sons were laying on the floor and stood up. These men had met their equal and slowly backed out the door before undertaking the long drive back. The final theory of who these guys were was Manson sympathizers. They probably intended to take advantage of my aunt and met their match. Lucky they were unarmed and not expecting a fight. The hill is a scary place at night. When I was 19 I had to complete basic military service in Austria, just like every Austrian around that age. During my time in the military we still had border controls, so of course my fellow recruits and me were called to action. After we completed our basic training. This was in November and the border region we were stationed at always had thick fog at this time of the year. In the later evening hours and the night especially. One night I was sent on patrol with a guy I didn't have much to do with at that point. As he wasn't one of my fellow recruits, but a private who volunteered for the operation. They did get paid rather well. Over the course of a single night patrols were required to visit a number of small cabins that acted as outposts and to stay there for a while. So, at one point in the night we arrive at this one outpost in the middle of nowhere. 
Only fields and woods in plain view, freezing cold and thick fog as always. At first, we just wanted to hang out in the cabin, but apparently that particular one was inhabited by a family of rats or mice or whatever. As pretty much the whole cabin was covered in fecal matter. So, we thought we'd just smoke a cigarette outside and then be on our way to the next outpost. As we're standing in the cold smoking, I suddenly hear weird, but rather remote noises from the fog-covered woods to the left of us. A few moments later, in a flash, the noises hit again. Although much louder and obviously closing in. Heavy, but fast, determined steps and a weird combination of gasping and deep grunting. Charging directly in our direction. We instantly stare at each other in shock and he screams run. We both bolt to the cabin, lock the door, assault rifle at the ready and unlocked. I like to think that I'm a very collected person, but at this very moment I'd probably have discharged my whole magazine into whatever would have come bursting through that very door. Standing there in suspense, thinking it can't get much worse, the cadet, who seemed like a completely regular guy up to this point, suddenly turns and says, I did not tell you that I'm a vampire, did I? I didn't get what he wanted to imply with this statement at that time, because I had a classmate back in school who apparently also believed to be a vampire, so I was just like yeah, cool story. But apparently, in this very moment, this lunatic genuinely believed that he was a vampire who was being attacked by a werewolf of all things, it was even full moon, and I was being locked into the same cabin as him, with an unlocked assault rifle and 30 shots. We waited for at least one hour, and although nothing did attempt to tackle the door ultimately, we did actually see a rather large shadow lurking in the moonlit fog outside through the cabin window, for some minutes. It needs to be noted that I grew up in the city and am thus not really accustomed to the sounds of wildlife. From a rational point of view, it must have been a wild boar, they can be actually aggressive, depending on the season, as there should be no bears or similar animals in that region anymore. I was never again scared so shitless though. I was about two weeks into a solo three-week hike, crossing some low hills between one watershed and another. There was a little lake up in the hills, well off the beaten track, and I hadn't seen anyone for a couple of days. As I came down to the lake I noticed a horse's saddle slung over the branch of a tree. Weird, because there were no horses or anyone at all around. It wasn't cracked, looked to be in good condition, but it seemed to have been abandoned. I walked along the shores of the lake for a while. As I rounded a bush I came across the darndest sight, a dead horse, on its back, with all four legs sticking straight up into the air. If you've ever seen the movie Animal House it was like the horse that died in the dean's office. It can't have been dead long as it hadn't started to decompose that I could see, even though it was hot summer weather. Presumably the saddle had come from the horse. But why was it up in a tree, maybe half a kilometer away from the horse, and how had the horse died in such a weird position? And what had happened to the rider? I was working the night shift when it happened. I patrolled all the little sections in the park for wildlife disturbance and vandalism in the dark. That's what most people with bad intentions come out to do. It was really quiet one night when my radio went off, saying that there had been reports of screaming over by B campsite, right near the forest. When I arrived, it had stopped, but the people there were still shaken up, and they had reported this loud growling and guttural sounds coming out of the trees. Of course, when I got there, they were all standing around the fire, but nobody was talking or anything just before their screams, which had woken everybody up. People at campsite B said they also saw somebody running across the road in front of them, only to disappear in the brush. This had occurred between campsites A and C they too stopped their car to investigate what was going on. It happened so quickly that nobody could really get a good look. People from Sita said something ran past them too and started screaming. They could not tell what it was, and none of these people knew each other, nor had they met before this trip, 
They were all just random folks spending a weekend at the park. So, I followed the path that whatever had run across to see if I could find any tracks or anything. It was nearly impossible, all the ground was so hard, and there were lots of people milling about. The campsite for B is near a bunch of dense woods within the park, so it wasn't too surprising something made its way over there. I checked out campsite as since it was next and the closest to where the paths had crossed, but again, nothing turned up. The whole experience felt really strange, everybody seemed genuinely freaked out outside their tents, but they wouldn't talk much at all. They just kept staring into the black trees with their flashlights, looking for something, waiting for something to come out of the darkness. It was definitely eerie and extremely quiet. I kept my radio on me, thinking we would hear something, but we never did. Although the time I was there, I did not hear anything out of the ordinary. That night, we went home a few hours before sunrise since most people were still awake. The next day, everybody at that campsite packed up pretty quickly, leaving as fast as they could. I guess I had heard from the overnight ranger that this campsite saw something that terrorized their tent. I haven't really heard much about it since then, but apparently, whatever they saw really spooked them. It's a darn shame. I hope whatever it is does not drive traffic away, and people do enjoy camping all year round, so hopefully, whatever large animal this is goes away on its own. I'm hoping it's just maybe a moose or something and that maybe these people just got spooked. It is the woods, after all, and people's nerves are a lot more on edge when they're out in the darkness or encountering things they don't quite understand. I had just graduated from the police academy within six months when I had my very own sighting, and I still have yet to report it to my superiors. I was still in town on an early evening, on my way to meet up with some friends. I was stopped at a red light as the orange and yellow of the sun began to vanish behind the line of trees on the horizon. I noticed, out of my driver's side window, this large creature coming up alongside me. It looked like it had just crawled down from the hills and seemed to be trying to cross or travel as we both reached this intersection. It started watching me inside my car as I drove away and stayed next to me for at least a few miles before its size made it disappear into the darkening sky. The best way that I know how to describe it is that it looked like a half gargoyle, half human with black leathery skin, a long tail with the shape of a whip, and a kind of spade shape at the end. It appeared to have horns and sharp claws but still looked very human in nature wearing nothing more than what appeared to be a loincloth or possibly just a flap of black skin that was revealed when it crouched down. As you can imagine, I drove home in complete shock and disbelief but could do nothing to get the image out of my head. This thing flew about 30 to 50 feet above the ground the entire time, completely visible to anybody in eyeshot. What made things worse was that there was not another person around anywhere for miles which meant I could not get an explanation from anybody. This thing seemed to have been watching me as if it knew what I was thinking and where I was going. Since this encounter, many strange events have occurred, keeping me away from the location where I saw it years ago, including hearing things outside my window and seeing very bizarre things out in the woods. I tried to pick up the trail again after moving, but after a couple of days, Things started appearing inside my house as well as knocking on my doors and windows. It's almost as if it has followed me completely. The only thing that I know is that these beings are truly evil and need to be stopped. I feel like they've crossed over into our dimension and are even more monstrous than before. When I first got onto Reddit, I was hesitant about telling people what happened to me at night but I ended up deciding that this would be the best place because I could be anonymous and fully express what I experienced. This is not a joke or fake, nor am I looking for any kind of attention, notoriety, or fame. I don't want any upvotes, none of that. I truly hope that by writing this, someone somewhere will be able to help me, and I really need it. Thank you for your time, and thank you if you were able to read all of this. Oh. And one last thing I wanted to include, I don't think this has anything to do with demons or devils. I've seen a lot of people say this online, although it feels very similar. 
It is not something that appears in any religious text to my knowledge and certainly nothing that you would want to encounter up close and personal. I never expected my solo hunting trip in the secluded forests of Arizona to take such a terrifying turn. The idea was to hunt wild deer, but little did I know that I'd end up facing an unknown creature that seemed like something out of a nightmare. Venturing deep into the woods, I followed the path that led me further away from sunlight. The forest became dense, and shadows enveloped everything around me. My instincts told me to turn back, but my determination pushed me forward. As I pressed on, my senses heightened, and I caught a glimpse of movement in the distance. My heart pounded in my chest as I focused my gaze. My eyes widened in disbelief and fear as I saw what I can only describe as a monstrous entity. It stood upright on its two hind legs, and its thin, emaciated frame sent chills down my spine. Its arms were disproportionately long, almost touching the ground, resembling a gorilla trying to conceal its true height. The creature's eerie gaze locked onto mine, and I could see its crooked spine and deformed face without any horns. Instead, it had neck hair that resembled a fake mane, and its skin appeared moonlight gray, reflecting an unsettling shine in its eyes. I instinctively raised my rifle, my hands trembling as I aimed at the grotesque figure. The adrenaline coursing through my veins was the only thing keeping me steady. With a deep breath, I pulled the trigger, the gunshot echoing through the forest. But to my shock and horror, the creature sensed the danger and managed to dodge the bullet with unnatural speed and agility. Before I could react, the creature rushed towards me with incredible force. It tackled me to the ground, and I felt an excruciating pain in my side as I hit a protruding rock. Struggling to get back on my feet, I watched helplessly as the creature disappeared into the dark depths of the forest. Injured and shaken, I managed to pull out my phone and call for help. The park rangers came to my rescue, finding me battered and bewildered. They asked what had attacked me, and without hesitation, I described the chilling encounter in detail. The rangers exchanged skeptical glances, and I could sense that they didn't believe me entirely. They knew these woods like the back of their hands and had never come across any creature fitting my description. Perhaps they thought my injuries had clouded my judgment or that I had seen a bear or some other wildlife. Regardless, they patched me up and took me back to safety. My mind kept replaying the horrifying image of that creature. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to this mysterious encounter than anyone was willing to accept. At the time that this incident occurred I was homeless and got around on an old bicycle. One evening, I was looking for a spot to set up a quick campsite in a small patch of woods along a public bicycle path in West Central, Dark County, Ohio. I was cold and eager to get a small fire started and get into my sleeping bag. The area is a refuge for stray cats. Many locals drop off their unwanted or stray cats in this area and some local kind-hearted folks feed them and provide plastic containers for shelter. When I found what I thought would be a suitable spot to set up camp I set my bag down and walked a few steps to a large tree to empty my bladder. I had a small flashlight in my bag but the night sky provided enough light after my eyes were adjusted. Suddenly a cat dashed through the brush very near me and startling me, then another further to left. As I looked toward the sound of the last cat running I could make out the shape of the plastic containers in a small circle. These containers house some cats. I then noticed three sets of pinkish-orange glowing objects with slight movement. I first assumed the glowing objects were the reflection of three cats' eyes. After watching the objects further, approximately 30 seconds, I saw that the glowing was in fact some sort of eyewear worn by three human-like figures. As I knelt down to watch I could see these figures were handling the cats, and the subjects were wearing very low reflective off-white or grey coveralls. After about two minutes all three subjects turned their heads toward me. Thinking they might be animal control workers and not wanting to frighten them I stood up and asked, how are you doing? 
With no vocal response all three began moving towards me instantly closing the 30 feet that separated us. Slowly again I asked, what are you guys doing out here? They continued moving towards me. I heard them talking or communicating but inside my head and in a strange whisper. I couldn't understand. I also noticed they were shorter than me. I'm 5 foot 10 inches and guess they were 10 to 12 foot shorter than me. I turned got on my bicycle and pedaled out of there. After several minutes of fast riding I noticed no vehicles or signs of activity. It was almost like I entered a time warp. I didn't notice anyone or anything following me. I eventually found my way out of the area, but I was disoriented for many hours. I didn't sleep that night and continued riding west until I couldn't continue. I finally stopped and slept a few hours in a small park. I have no idea who those figures in the coveralls were, but I don't believe that they were human. The usually peaceful Amish neighborhood had been transformed into a hotbed of tense excitement and fear, all centered around a little white church standing serenely on the prairie. The Amish farmers and their families, known for their sedate and staid ways, were now gripped by curiosity and anxiety. The cause of their disquiet was a real live ghost that had taken a liking to haunting the immediate vicinity of the church. Rumors of the playful and ethereal apparition spread like wildfire among the villagers. Stout-hearted men, unafraid of fear, claimed to have seen it, describing a four-foot-tall figure with broad and squat proportions, long arms, and unnaturally large black eyes. The ghost's first appearance had been witnessed by a young man from Clarion, who encountered it one night after returning home from spending time with his sweetheart. He shared his eerie experience with the villagers, but despite many keeping a watchful eye, the ghost remained elusive. Determined to debunk the stories and prove their bravery, four young men armed themselves with courage and muscle and set out to investigate the haunted church. As they circled the building and its surroundings, nothing seemed out of the ordinary, and they began to doubt the tales. However, as they passed the church again, they were startled to find what seemed like a shadow crouching on the steps. The strange figure beckoned them with its eerie hands, inviting them to follow. Attempting to confront the ghost, they aimed their weapons, but it vanished every time they looked directly at it. Fear gripped them, their hair stood on end, and their bodies were drenched in sweat. The ghost seemed to taunt them, appearing on the church roof its arms outstretched in a chilling gesture. Overwhelmed and frightened, they decided to retreat from the haunted place, no longer doubting the existence of the apparition. Their harrowing encounter spread like wildfire, and many ridiculed them, dismissing the ghost as a mere figment of their imagination. But the four young men stood firm, adamant that they had seen and felt the ghost's eerie presence. Since that fateful night, the bravest and most reckless among the villagers kept a vigilant watch, determined to solve the mystery of the ghost. Despite the scoffs and laughter from some, the four witnesses remained steadfast in their claim, convinced that they had encountered something otherworldly that defied explanation. The little white church on the prairie became a beacon of curiosity and trepidation, attracting both the daring and the doubtful. The mystery of the playful ghost continued to linger in the hearts of the villagers, leaving them to wonder what lay beyond the realm of their understanding and experience. And so, the neighborhood remained wrapped in tension and anticipation, with each night bringing a fresh wave of brave souls hoping to unlock the secrets of the enigmatic spirit that called the church its home. In my senior year of high school a small group of like six of us decided to go camping one night, but none of us told our parents or anyone else what we were doing or where we were going. We ended up going to this campground but all the sites were taken so we drove really far out, to the point where we no longer saw campsites and we reached the end of the road. We found a small clearing that would fit our two cars and huge tent. It was already pitch black when we got there so we couldn't see anything and set up a fire. We cooked some food, sat up telling stories and eventually set up the big eight-person tent to sleep. We had heard a pack of coyotes and I swear I heard a panther, though my group didn't hear it, 
so I was already pretty spooked, not to mention my crippling anxiety, but managed to fall asleep, feeling somewhat safe with the six of us in the tent. Now, I'm an extremely light sleeper and wake up to even the slightest sound. Every crunch and rustle woke me up but what woke me around 1 in the morning really scared the shit out of me. Something was sniffing at my head from the outside of the tent. I immediately started crying and woke up my friend next to me, when the sniffing stopped, telling her what had happened. She tried brushing it off until it had sniffed us again, this time closer to her head. Whatever it was began circling our tent then. I legitimately thought I was doing to die that night. We woke up everyone else and there we were, huddled together scared shirtless waiting for whatever it was to go away. Eventually after circling our tent many times and continued sniffing it left. It was the worst sleep I've ever gotten. When we woke up that morning we left right away but, not before seeing the big sign that said bear sanctuary in our small clearing. It could have been a dog but it kept circling our tent and sounded big and along with the bear sanctuary and supposed panther hearing, I doubt it was just a dog. A few years back I lived in Arizona, I would always travel to Tucson, Mesa, and Flagstaff but spent most of my time living in good old Phoenix. While down near Tucson, really close to San Xavier Reservation, I was wandering in a small town and stayed near the edge of the town so I can take in the view of the bare desert during the day. I was much younger than I am right now, so this might have been just my imagination, but I don't think so. My imagination wasn't that visual and messed up. While staring into the night of the desert to take a quick leak and get back on the road. I got done draining the lizard and tried to take in the view of pitch black valley illuminated by passing car lights and the starlit sky. I would look into the desert when a car passed by and would gaze into the distance for a split second. Nothing came up and I didn't think anything would. The Arizona Valley was something I've always been used, that being that, the darkness of the desert was nothing to fear for me. After about the 10th or 11th car passed, I spotted something in the distance that caught me off guard and at first, I didn't pay any mind to it. I was curious and waited for a car's light to light up some of the distance, now of course cars didn't illuminate the whole valley, only about 15 to 20 feet or 20 to 30 feet. So whatever I saw was pretty damn close, way too close for comfort. I stayed for another car to pass which felt like 5 minutes, which was only 10 seconds in reality, after the a couple cars passed to light up my vision. 15th car speeds by. Holy s I think to myself after realizing what I saw wasn't just my mind messing with me. I saw what seemed to be a person walking alone, it would have thrown me off if it was a regular guy wandering in the dark but what really messed with me was how it walked and looked the only way to describe his, or hers, or whatever the f it was was like a cripple or a mentally handicapped person that has been in a wheelchair all their life trying to walk, stumbling and waddling, dragging their leg ever so often. From what little I made out of its facial features made me cringe and shudder, making my stomach drop to my ass. Its face seemed to be male. Its jaw was disfigured, and the face was ghastly skinny and empty, Big eye bags that made its eye sockets look empty, mouth wide open that also looked hollow. Other physical attributes I made out was that it had no cloths, deathly skinny, tall and I mean freakishly tall. And incredibly dirty. Probably looked white. From how dirty it was I would have thought it wasn't even human. After I've seen all I needed to see I noped the f out of there, hopped back into the car and went on with my night. Wasn't able to sleep that night because I couldn't help get curious or think about it. Not sure what the F it was. Maybe I was straight tripping that night but it seemed way too real to be my imagination or random hallucinations. And for the record, there aren't any homeless people just wandering the desert in the dead of night with no cloths on, that I've seen or heard of. But please, give me your thoughts and tread on this post if you think it's bullshit, I don't blame you but I swear it was as real as possible.
I grew up in rural southwestern Ontario and our property was flanked by trees and then it was 100 acres of corn. One summer evening we were playing hide and seek with some friends and family. I was hiding near a pine tree about 50 meters from the road waiting until I could avoid the person who was it. I was the last person and could see everyone else waiting for me on the porch yelling to hurry up so we could start the next round. Suddenly I hear what are clearly footsteps behind me and I bolt assuming it's my cousin who is it trying to tag me. I sprint across the yard and make it to the porch only to realize he is on the opposite side of the house. We suddenly hear or see car lights as it starts up and peels down the road. I have no idea why someone would get out of their car, walk 50 meters through the corn but I was certainly spooked and assumed they had malicious intent. My parents were all into the supernatural and said it was a ghost. Which in retrospect seems like a retarded thing to say to a 9 year old child. But whoever it was gave me a scare that I still won't forget. Last summer I felt like camping one weekend so myself and a buddy went to a spot he knew about that wasn't too far from where we lived. About 40 minute drive and a few kilometers hike to the spot. I've always been a big pussy about the dark. My imagination is stupid and vivid and f with me. Anyway we were settling down for the night and we had our tent set up about 50 feet from each other because I snore sometimes plus no spots could fit both tents as it was pretty thick with brush and rock. I get woken up at some point by a noise. My heart is racing but I figure I'm going to hear a lot of noises in the bush at night and try to go back to sleep. As I'm drifting off I hear a loud crack, almost like a gunshot in the near distance. I sit straight up and start sweating. What the f was that? No way that is an animal. Then I hear a cough and someone clearing their throat. My mind is running through all sorts of crazy scenarios so I text my friend are you awake? Did you hear that? No answer. Another throat clear. My brain convinces itself that my friend is now dead and we are being hunted. I freeze and grab my knife so I can poke my head out. If I'm going to die, I rather not do it shaking like a leaf in my sleeping bag. I get two steps out of my tent and a crouched figure is moving towards me. Again my legs freeze for a second and then. My friend lights his smoke and says check this out. What the f, you're alive. I nearly shit myself. Jesus. What was that noise then? Turns out it was seals playing in the water. They slap the surface really hard and it makes a very loud crack. I felt really dumb but goddamn was I genuinely scared for a bit. This happened when I was about 14 to 15 and often stayed over at my cousin and her husband's house. We'll call them Skylar and Josh, I think F24M26 at the time. I'd been staying at their house for a week straight prior to the incident with no issues. It was the summertime in a neighborhood that was pretty rapidly expanding, you know those monochrome suburban nightmare called a sacks. There were tons of half-finished houses lining the far end of the neighborhood. I feel this info is pretty important. Anyways, Josh and I are avid movie watchers and stayed up late most nights watching whatever looked good. That night, Skylar went to bed early and we stayed up to watch Would You Rather, then Ridiculous 6, Movie Sucks, by the way. Semi-important context, Josh is a smoker and goes out to the back patio for a cigarette every so often, especially at night when he takes their beagle, banjo, out to pee. I end up sleeping through the movie on one of their two couches, this couch is backed against a wall, and to the left of it is a window into the backyard. It's the only window in the living room. At some point, I keep hearing banjo whooping and hollering in the playroom, then again in the kitchen, then the playroom, and so on so forth. Dogs going apeshit in literally every room of the first floor, but he's a clingy dog that hated when Skylar and Josh shut him out of their room, so I figured he was just whining. He's also a beagle, so we're used to him being vocal. I'm hindsight, I probably should have wondered why he was running from room to room, though. Whatever, I try to sleep through it. After a good while of banjo flipping his shit in what I think is the kitchen, he kinda goes quiet, 
but he wakes me up again growling at the window right next to the couch I'm sleeping on. Bro will not be still. I still don't get up. I fall back asleep for a bit, then out of nowhere, he jumps on the couch, right on my stomach, and again starts losing his shit barking and howling. That wasn't what woke me up though. It was the light shining from outside the window right in my face. I wasn't scared at first, more confused than anything since my eyes haven't adjusted at this point. Then the flashlight shines up, right on this man's face, and he looks identical to Joshua could have been twins. He's crouched down with his face almost right up on the glass, and when I see him, I jump really hard. I don't remember if I screamed, but the man starts laughing at me. And I can hear it from the other side of the window. However, because I'm big stupid, I assume it's Josh on a smoke break, just trying to spook me. I start walking upstairs, and I pass by their kitchen clock. Bitch it was like 4 a.m. I didn't even put two and two together that Josh has no reason to be outside and awake at this hour. I'm so groggy but also unnerved at this point, so I go sleep on the upstairs hallway floor. I didn't go alert Skylar of what just happened, mostly because she's a cranky bitch when you wake her up, and I was still more willing to accept the idea that it was Josh being an idiot on a smoke break rather than some maniac scoping out the house. The next afternoon, I bring it up to them, and they sort of write it off, ask me if I'm sure I wasn't dreaming, etc. But they did say they heard the dog going wild. I check outside where the window is to see if the man dropped any evidence of him being there, and I kinda wanted to vomit. The tall grass along the house was pressed down like someone was on their knees. I don't even want to know how long the man was sitting there for the grass to have been pressed down still, but I have a feeling it was pretty long, because Banjo sat by that window for a hot minute, and the flashlight is the only thing that woke me up. I'm glad I saw the grass though, because it felt like such a fever dream. Sometimes I still wonder if it happened, but I know it did. My theory is that some squatter in those unfinished houses was either bored or on something and decided to go on an adventure. But yeah, I would have absolutely gotten my shit rocked in a horror movie at that age. Okay so I've never posted like this before so forgive me for any mistakes. But about an hour ago I headed to a nearby lake, a place I usually go for my therapy sessions because it's usually pretty serene and peaceful. About 90% of the area can be seen from the busy road, however there are a few blind spots. So I pulled into my usual parking area and immediately got a weird feeling when I saw another car parked kind of hidden under a tree close by. I'm a female in my 20s so I'm always on high alert. I made sure to keep my eye on the car when getting my stuff together in my car. One second I look up and no one is in the car and then a couple seconds later I look again and a man is suddenly sitting in the driver's seat staring at me. It was like he came out of nowhere. At this point I'm pretty wary about going out into the grass by the lake but I continue to slowly pack up my stuff while continuing to keep an eye on the man in the car. I open my door and the man immediately gets out of his car and stands in front of it, doing a weird stretch and still staring at me. This lake is very close to a very popular amusement park so it's not uncommon for travelers to stop at the lake to rest. So I try to reason in my mind and decide I'll just sit in the car for my therapy appointment. I still had about 15 minutes before it started to get settled. So I get into my back seat and close and lock the doors but rolled one window down because it was hot in the car. I open up my laptop and I look over at the man again and now he's opening up an almost empty bottle of windshield wiper fluid and starts to pour it into his car as he looks up at me. His whole vibe was sketchy and creepy and I was debating on leaving. The man then pulls out his phone, does something on it, then continues to fill his washer fluid. All of a sudden a white van with no windows rolls up and parks right behind me. No one gets out. I immediately climb over the console into the driver's seat and started to pull away. The van was close to my car but there was enough room for me to back up and pull out of there. A couple seconds after I pull away the van follows, and the man gets back in his car. 
I panicked but was able to pull out onto the road in between two cars so the van wasn't able to catch up with me. I made sure no one was following me as I drove home. It might have all been a coincidence but better safe than sorry. I also called the non-emergency line just in case and they said they would send an officer out there to patrol the area for a bit. Thanks for reading if you did, it was a scary experience especially as someone who's been acid. I'd like to hear any feedback or similar stories if anyone has any. So our boys ages are 3 and 2. A few days ago, about 30 minutes after we had put the boys to bed, I was in our front living room when all of the sudden I heard our oldest son crying out for me. I peeked my head out into the hallway and looked into our other living room real quick to see if my husband was already on it. He wasn't, so I walked down the hallway and went into the boys' bedroom and both of the boys were sound asleep. Weird. I shut the door and walk into the main living room where my husband was and told him what just happened. He just shrugged his shoulders and said he didn't hear anything. The room I was in is closer to their bedroom so I could see how he didn't hear him. Then last night just after midnight I laid down to go to bed. I was almost asleep until I heard my youngest son start to cry over the monitor. I waited a few seconds to see if he was just moving around and would fall back asleep or if it was the real deal. He starts hysterically crying so I jump up and run down the hallway to their bedroom. The boys are sound asleep. I'm very confused. I go back to bed and fall asleep. Now a little backstory. I am a very heavy sleeper. My husband always had to wake me up when the boys were babies when they would wake up in the middle of the night because I didn't hear them. He always says I could sleep through the world ending and I would never know. So after I fell back asleep I get woken up at 5 am to my youngest son hysterically crying again over the monitor. A little side note, both times I look at the monitor I don't see either of the boys moving. I see them peacefully sleeping but I hear the seeing. I get my sleepy self up, look over at my sleeping husband, thought it strange that he was asleep and didn't wake me up, and sleeplessly walk down to the boy's bedroom. They are both sound asleep. Now I feel like I'm losing it. I know what I heard. No T verses were on when any of these occurrences happened. We don't own a radio. And our monitor is one of those dinosaur ones so it doesn't hook up to Wi-Fi or anything. And the first occurrence with my oldest son I heard with my own ears when my son was crying mommy. I didn't even have the monitor on. I feel like I'm going crazy. Nothing like this has ever happened before. One time I got woken up to something whistling outside our bedroom windows at 3 am. A few months ago. It kept moving from one window to the other in a matter of seconds. Very earring whistling. We have a fenced in backyard and the one window is in the fenced in area. Our fence is six feet high so that scared me even more thinking something was on our roof. I was absolutely terrified and frozen in bed. It finally stopped and I went back to bed. I talked to our next door neighbor about it that's lived out here his whole life and he said Hess seen and heard things out here that people would think Hess insane. We live on a quiet dead end road with a swamp or heavy woods in our backyard. In 2017 I had heard news of people dressing up as clowns and running around with knives at night. I typically brush those things up because I got my own problems. I, at the time 20 female, was often up all hours of the night dealing with my screaming newborn. It was January or February so we still had some snow and I wasn't able to get out of the house often. Taking out the trash, which is located right out the back door, was usually the most I got of fresh air. One morning I took out the trash and happened to glance over to the right and noticed footprints directly under the window to my baby's room. I walked over to inspect and not only were there footprints but there was also hand indentations on the window screen. Weird but baby slept in my room so not very concerned at the moment but boyfriend was losing his marbles. Fast forward a couple days and I was up around 3 am and heard not exactly what I would call screaming but more of a screeching howl. We have lots of stray cats so I kinda thought that's what it was and ignored it. 
Once the sun was up I looked out the window and noticed a few sets of footprints that really didn't make sense because it kind of looked like someone had Zhu been passing in between the houses but again I blow it up because we had a drug house across the street and we have had people cross through our yard before to get to that house. Maybe four nights later again at 3 am I'm breastfeeding and hear a dragging noise against the house and from where I was sitting on my couch I could see the back door. The back door has a window with blinds on it and doesn't seal well due to wood rot on the frame. I pause the TV and listen Zhu to hear it again now directly at the back door. Looking over I can clearly see a looming figure Zhu standing in the window. Holding one of those big kitchen knives and granted the blinds were shut so I'm seeing the creepy shadow version of this. He runs the knife across the window panes before softly knocking. Meanwhile I'm trying to figure out what to do with a newborn latched on because my phone is in the bedroom and something in me doesn't want whoever this is out of my vision. So I stand up and readjust because I really didn't want a screaming baby right then and walking into my kitchen and flick on the light and then said, just loud enough for him to hear me, hey man I already called the police and I'm sure you don't want to deal with them so why don't you go home. I don't know why I talked to him so calm and normal like but I don't think he was expecting anyone to say anything because he froze the moment I began talking. He talked it over with himself for a minute and darted down toward the alleyway. Never had anything like that happen again but boyfriend sure was mad I didn't wake him up to handle the situation or at least actually call the police. Not sure if this counts as a creepy encounter but I sure was creeped out once my sleep deprived self realized what happened. Yes, this is real, and it happened this morning. I woke up feeling like any other ordinary day. The sun was slowly peeking through the curtains, casting a warm glow in the room. I needed to charge my phone. So I went to unplug my roommate's phone to plug mine in. That's when I saw it, a missed call notification on her phone. Curiosity got the better of me, and I glanced at the caller ID below the phone number. Without thinking, I blurted out the name of the caller to my roommate. She chuckled, assuming I was playing a prank, until I handed her the phone. I could see her face change in an instant, her expression filled with disbelief and fear. She stammered, telling me it was her mom who was calling. Her mom, who had tragically passed away in 2006. The phone call had ended a second after she realized who it was. As she tried to gather her thoughts, she decided to call the number back. To our astonishment, an automated voice answered, saying, press 1 for yes and 2 for no. We were both perplexed and terrified. How was it possible that her deceased mother's phone number was calling her? Her mom's number had never been stored in her contacts. It couldn't be a simple glitch, this was far too eerie and unsettling for that. A million questions raced through our minds. Was someone playing a sick joke, or was this something much more sinister? Could someone be stalking her, using her deceased mother's number to torment her? Or was it some inexplicable paranormal occurrence? We sat there, hearts pounding, minds racing. The room seemed to grow colder as we contemplated the inexplicable event. Our thoughts were consumed by the possibilities of what this could mean. Were we in danger? Was her mother trying to send a message from beyond the grave? Neither of us knew what to do next. Fear and confusion engulfed us. We decided to reach out to friends and family to see if they had experienced anything similar or had any insights into this strange phenomenon. No one had answers, and each call only added to the sense of unease. Hours passed, and we were still no closer to understanding what had happened. It felt like we were caught in a surreal nightmare, unable to wake up. As the day wore on, we tried to distract ourselves, but the bizarre event lingered in the back of our minds haunting us. Finally, as the evening set in, we found some solace in each other's company. Together, we held on to the hope that maybe it was just an inexplicable glitch or a cruel prank. We agreed to keep a close eye on her phone and seek help if anything like this ever happened again. As the night crept in, we sought refuge in the presence of friends and tried to find comfort in the mundane routines of everyday life. Yet, deep down, 
we knew that this strange and unsettling event had forever changed our perception of reality. To this day, we remain haunted by that inexplicable phone call. We may never know the truth behind what happened that morning, but one thing is certain, it left an indelible mark on our lives, a chilling reminder that sometimes the boundaries between the living and the beyond are not as clear as we'd like to believe. So someone was following me home yesterday, and now I don't want to leave the house. I 15F was walking home from the store yesterday and I saw a black box car drive past me extremely slow and the man in the car clearly watching me. And when he fully passed me I saw him watching me in his rear view mirror. I thought it was weird and slowed down my pace so that I could tell if he was waiting for me or just a slow driver. He was still driving extremely slow but moved a little when he saw two guys riding past on bikes. He then moved to the edge of the short street we were on and waited there. I was still towards the beginning of the street so I acted like I forgot something and turned around to get out of his sight. I waited and kind of peeked out to see if he had left, and when I saw he was gone I continued walking. I didn't think it would happen but I made a mental note that if I saw the car behind me, it meant he circled back around. After I continued walking I made three turns and was three turns away from my house. When I was walking up a little hill and almost at the four turn I looked back and saw the man at the corner I had just turned from, letting me know he circled back around to find me. He sat there watching me continue walking until I got up the little hill and turned the corner. Then as I had just barely made the last turn and was close to my house I saw the man's car just turn the corner up the street, straight across from the way I was walking, waiting there. I pulled out my phone to call my mom and walked the other way and he left soon after I pulled out my phone. My mom came out and walked with me back to the house and I didn't see the car for the rest of the day. But I keep thinking, he knows what neighborhood I stay in. What if he comes back? What if the next time he comes back I'm out by myself again? What if no one's home to call? What if he sees me leaving and comes back when I'm the only one home? I'm so scared he's going to come back I don't want to go outside. I don't want to show him where I live especially because I'm home alone very often. I have summer school and I have to go but I don't want to leave the house in fear he might be waiting for me. And I'm constantly looking out the windows to see if I can spot him. Especially since if he was at the store I was at, he definitely stays somewhere near the neighborhood. Okay so ever since I was 5 I have been sensitive to energies, I see ghosts and speak to dead people and such. But this is crazy because it has happened not one not two but three times. The first time it happened I was 5, I remember I had just gotten home from kindergarten and I went to take a nap, during the nap I remember sitting at a table with my papa, by this time in his life he already had bad heart failure and kidney failure so he was on dialysis. He told me don't worry about anything, you will be okay, at this time I was newly diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that would to me later having open heart at 10 and now at 16 I'm in heart failure and stage 3 kidney disease, he also told me that he loves me and that he would watch me forever. I woke up and my mom was crying I found out that my papa's heart had stopped. The next time this happens I'm around 10 years old, I was at my dad's house and I was going to bed. My dream sequence started with me seeing my aunt on a beautiful homestead or ranch. She was dressed in a flowing white dress and she just looked so at peace, then I see this dark figure come and it takes her away, while she's screaming and getting taken she looks at me and says I'm gone now I woke up and I found out she overdosed. The last time this happened was probably 4 years ago maybe even earlier. I was sleeping at my grandma's house, and I have a dream about her sister, my great aunt, my great aunt had bad dementia, I see her but younger, and literally all she said was I remember everything again. And I kid you not the next morning I find out she passed. In my family, a lot of people are Catholic, but a lot of people are also psychic and are mediums. I think I'm an empath because of my sensitivities and a lot more experiences I've had. But I don't know, this is kinda freaky.
So to sum it up I agreed to taking care of this family's dogs for 5 days and the dogs have been great. Happy healthy normal pups in a somewhat seemingly normal house. I met the lady prior to coming and even came in the house and things seemed normal. First night I got here was fine until about the second day when all of a sudden the AC stopped working. It reached all the way up to 83 degrees where I was staying, upstairs, so I had to move down to the basement including the animals. Third night we are downstairs in the basement. Prior to going to sleep I left my phone plugged in vertically on the nightstand next to me and had all the dogs in their spots for the evening. I wake up at 4:30 a.m. I can tell by my watch, to my phone being unplugged from the wall and phone completely dead. I then things that strange because Ernsta is no way I could do that in my sleep but whatever. I get up to go use the restroom and I hear something in the bathroom. The shower was turned on and running water was going straight into the drain. With that being said there was water soaked all over the ground. I had to use 6 towels to clean it up. Then the next day rolls around and I decided to give one of the dogs a bath in the upstairs shower. At this point the AC guy came out to fix it and said there was nothing he could do until he was able to check the pressure within a few hours he would come back. He never came back and the AC went back to normal. When all of a sudden the whole shower rack falls on my head and almost hit the dog. Anyways as the night unfolds I slept fine but I woke up at 7:30 a.m. to let the dogs out and I go to look at my phone and the charger is bent and stuck inside my charging port. Now I have to use a different one. It's my last night here and I don't really know what to expect now. Maybe I'm just overreacting but something just doesn't feel right. Is this maybe something paranormal or just paranoia LOL? I was wondering if I should share this random spooky moment that happened around 10 years ago with my now ex-girlfriend. I am also open to shared psychosis if that's how that works because we both heard from the living room the sound of plastic bag being either rubbed with itself or with another bag in my room. It was very clear, crisp, not loud enough to be a jump scare but enough for us to hear it. We thought it was a bag that could have been blowing around in my room from the AC or something but it was spookier after investigating and finding nothing. We looked at each other like there's no way there's not a plastic bag in here. What made that sound? These days I don't care. I still sleep in this room without her. So am I the plastic bag? A little background. We were both into horror movies and spooky stories, scenarios and would even sometimes accidentally scare each other walking around the house. She was fun, but she wasn't a trickster. Even if there was a third party, say another trickster or even ghost causing the fuss, they'd still have to produce a plastic bag. My ex and I were going camping and I found a spot not far out of town. Since neither of us have been there before I accidentally drove past the campground and went down a logging road for a few miles. It was getting dark and I realized we should turn back. I obviously missed it. So I stopped the car and do one of those 6 point turns in the middle of the dirt road. On our left is a steep hill going down. On the right it's a hill going up with tree stumps and some bushes. Well as I'm turning around On the hill going up we both see a naked very huge dude with a smaller person on his back. They were just standing there in the bushes and when they noticed us started stampeding down the hill toward us. Both of us freaking out and I finally complete the turn around and speed the FK out of there. We went straight back into town about 20 miles away. We didn't go camping that night. To this day I would have thought I imagined it. I could not tell if it was an actual person and my girlfriend confirmed she's seen the same thing. Second weirdest thing to happen to me in my life. It's crazy how your brain just dismisses things it can't explain. If my girlfriend was not there I would have forgotten it happened. I'm a recreational sailor with a 26 foot sloop. So I don't venture out on the high seas. I stay coastal. One night I decided to anchor up in this protected bayou. It was summertime and there was a good chance of overnight thunderstorms. 
So I carefully made my way through a pretty narrow channel that opens up some to a bayou that is protected well enough many people will stash their boat in there during hurricanes. Plus it's usually a nice spot just to hang out. I got there late, around 11 pm, so I had to feel my way in through the dark. There was no moon, and even if there was the cloud cover was thick enough it would have been blocked anyway. So it was slow going and a little disorienting. Once I reached the area that opens up a bit I dropped anchor, and prepped the boat in case a storm blew up. I made sure the halyards wouldn't bang around, secured the sails, stuff like that. Then I made my dinner and hopped in the forward berth with a book. Now you get used to odd noises. Boats have a way of occasionally creaking and clanging a bit. It's a part of their soul. Quite often you will hear a porpoise blow nearby. But this night really scared me for a bit. First, the wind picked up. A lot. The air rushing by my rigging began to make it vibrate so that it was making a high pitching humming noise. That's not scary but it kept me awake. And since it was the standing rigging there wasn't anything I could do about it. So I'm lying there wide awake in the dark listening to this hum noise. I'm not freaked out, but it's a very mournful noise. A short while later as I'm huddled in my bunk, I feel the bulkhead flex next to me at the same time I hear a very loud thud followed by a splash. What the F? So I race out on deck with my flashlight and work my way up to the bow. It's windy, so at first I though maybe the boat was swinging on anchor and it hit a piling or something. I inspect the area and don't see anything I could have hit. So I grabbed my spotlight and used it to look underwater as best I could. I didn't see anything submerged either. Okay, so I'm thinking it was a dolphin or perhaps an alligator. The lightning is starting to pick up in the distance, it's still windy, and despite the fact it's summer I'm getting chilled just standing around on deck in my skivvies. So I climb back below and try to get rest. About 10 minutes later, once again, thud. Again I go back up on deck and investigate. And again, aside from annoying a pelican who was perched on a piling about 30 yards away, I find nothing. I go back to bed. Several minutes later, thud. Splash. This went on for about two hours. I didn't sleep well that night. The next morning before I set sail, I thoroughly searched the area. I was anchored on a soft mud bottom and never did find a piling, or submerged stump, or anything that I would have hit. To this day I have no idea what it was but it was a very freaky night for me. I still think it might have been some manner of animal but why on earth it kept coming back over the course of two hours is beyond me. I remember the day like it was yesterday. I was on duty, stationed in the Navy, keeping watch over the vast expanse of the ocean. It was a calm day, with the sun shining brightly and a gentle breeze sweeping across the deck. Little did I know that what I was about to witness would forever shake my belief in reality. As I scanned the horizon, my eyes caught something unusual in the distance. A warship, seemingly from the World War II era, caught my attention. It was positioned at a nearish distance by naval standards, and what caught me off guard was the fact that it was staying perfectly still. It almost looked like a ghostly apparition, suspended in time. Curiosity got the better of me, and I couldn't tear my gaze away. Suddenly, without any warning, the warship's guns started firing. I braced myself for the deafening roar that should have followed, but to my utter bewilderment, there was no sound. The guns fired, and yet, it was as if I had suddenly lost my sense of hearing. It was eerie and unnerving. I couldn't fathom how a warship firing its guns, even at a distance, could be so silent. The experience sent shivers down my spine, and I felt a chill creeping up my back. It was like witnessing a surreal scene straight out of a sci-fi movie. In my state of shock, I decided to call over a fellow mate to witness this bizarre phenomenon. I needed confirmation that I wasn't losing my mind or succumbing to some strange illusion. As he approached, I pointed out the ghostly warship, and his eyes widened in astonishment. What in the world is that? He whispered, barely able to find his voice. 
I have no idea, I replied, my voice tinged with disbelief. We both stood there, side by side, watching the inexplicable sight unfold before us. The warship remained in its stationary position, firing its guns silently into the distance. We exchanged glances, trying to make sense of the impossible. Neither of us could explain what we were seeing. It was as if we had stumbled upon some otherworldly time warp or a holographic projection from the past. It defied all rational explanations, leaving us bewildered and filled with an uneasy feeling. Eventually, the warship slowly faded away, like a mirage dissipating in the heat. We were left standing there, staring at the empty expanse of the ocean, trying to process what we had just witnessed. Till this day, I still don't have a logical explanation for what happened that day. Some say it was a strange atmospheric phenomenon or an optical illusion. Others believe it was a glimpse into a parallel dimension. But for me and my mate, the memory of the silent World War II warship will forever remain a haunting mystery, a reminder that there are things in this world, and perhaps beyond it, that defy our understanding and challenge the very fabric of reality. I was with my parents on vacation at Russian River in California. We had rented a cabin that was probably 10 miles out of a small town. The cabin had a dry river bed behind it, and one day I decided to go exploring. I was walking along the river bed for maybe 15 to 20 minutes when I came across a large and abandoned campsite that was in a clearing. There were five or so old tents, with clothes and stuff scattered about. Everything was really dirty and tattered looking so it has been there a while. I was standing there staring at it wanting to move closer, but knowing I shouldn't. As I was taking the scene and I heard a stick snap in the hill up to my right. I whirled around looking in the direction, scanning the tree line but didn't see anything. Seeing as there could be at least five people hiding, judging by the tents, I decided to turn around. I was walking as quickly as I could along the rocky river bed without tripping, all while occasionally hearing a twig snap or the crunch of leaves once every few minutes over to my left. I kept looking behind me and up at the trees to see if I could see anything but didn't. I finally made it to another clearing where the tree line was further back and whoever or whatever was following me would have been forced to step into the open or move way further away to stay concealed. I took the chance to run the remaining distance as fast as I safely could back to the cabin. Could this be a Bigfoot? Once I went biking and camping in the Missourian Lakes District in Poland. Except a few ports full of tourists it's quite a remote place and you can ride for lots of miles through forests without meeting anyone. So me and my ex-boyfriend had a map of campsites in the area and moved from one to another. Usually those were typical campings, with staff electricity etc. But sometimes we slept in abandoned sites which was pretty creepy. Anyway, one day we decide to go to this campsite by the lake my boyfriend visited when he was a kid. We even found online that it was still open and hoped it'll be fine. Previously boyfriend told me of an old Prussian cemetery in the forest nearby and that some of the graves were open so you can see human bones, I was scared as hell but thought it'll be okay if there are people around. So we go there but it turns out there's no road to this place and we have to cross some fields on the way there, leaving nearest buildings more than 4 miles behind. Meanwhile, there's a storm coming from the opposite side of the lake. When we get there, Everything's in complete ruin. There was some food left as if someone didn't care about finishing it, the buildings of the campsite were deliberately destroyed, even the pier was taken out of the water, remnants of the campsite just floating around. I was really scared and wanted to get back but my boyfriend walked around and said it'll be fine. So with all the destruction around there was a portable toilet just standing there like no one cared to take it away. It was closed. I approached it and heard wailing from inside. It was very loud and sounded like a human crying, but without any words. I ran to my boyfriend and said I'm really scared. He told me it was just the wind but after approaching the toilet he admitted it did sound like a human. 
We tried knocking and asking if everything was okay but all we heard were those crying noises. We even tried to open the thing but it was like someone was holding it from the inside and crying louder and sadder. There was also an empty beer bottle in front of the toilet, like someone entered it and someone else put a bottle by the door. As you can expect, we got more scared every minute, with the storm and the forest and the graveyard and this wailing so we just ran away from there. My dad once told me how he and a couple of buddies were hunting in the deep New Zealand bush and suddenly stumbled into a small area where the bush or shrub had been all squashed down. It quickly got really weird as they noticed that something really large had moved from there. Like just thrashing or forcefully crashing its way through the bush. It got shit freaky as they also noticed that there was massive amounts of fresh, i.e., wet, blood accompanying the trail of broken bush. Apparently we're talking about heaps of blood, like Jesus Christ, surely whatever made this is bleeding out and lying dead just around the corner. They kept tracking this thing for 10 to 15 minutes expecting to find? The largest bush mammal we have here is deer and there are no large predators here. So they keep tracking and suddenly the blood or crash trail abruptly stops. All signs of bush crashing and heavy bleeding come to a sudden and unexplained end. This was deep in uninhabited bush and still to this day there is no logical answer. For so much recent blood loss and no explanation for it, needless to say they were all really creeped out. I work on the search and rescue team, and I have a very interesting case to share with you. I know I'm not allowed to normally discuss this stuff, but I believe that this missing case might be the work of an alien abduction. It all began when I received a frantic call from a mother about her missing daughter. They were camping just outside of Bend, Oregon. I rushed to meet them at their campsite. The family had been staying there for a few days, and on that particular morning, the mother and father went down to the river while their daughter climbed into one of the riverside trees to get a better view of the scenery. That was the last anyone saw of her. She disappeared without a trace. The mother frantically searched for her, but there was no sign that she had fallen or ever come down from where she was. The family became grief-stricken and panicked, finally calling us for help. We searched all around the area for any clues but couldn't find anything. The whole day passed, and as evening approached, we expanded our search party, but still, there was no trace of her. Even the dogs couldn't pick up on her scent. Eventually, the helicopter located her about 12 miles north of the location where she had gone missing. Miraculously, she was completely fine, unharmed, and unscathed. The dogs helped lead us to her, but when we found her, she was in a state of complete and utter terror. She was rocking back and forth, murmuring strange things. We asked if she was okay, but she didn't reply. She was taken back to her family, but her expression remained unchanged. She never gave us any concrete answers about what had happened to her, just murmuring about being taken and not being allowed to leave. It was puzzling how she had traveled such a distance in such a short amount of time. The terrain between her and where she was found was rough and challenging, yet she was unscathed in her outfit and flip-flops. It simply didn't make any sense. I can't help but think that something extraordinary happened to her, and part of me wants to believe it was aliens. It's the only thing that seems to explain everything. But, of course, I could be wrong. We may never know the truth behind what happened that day, but the poor girl was clearly frightened by something or someone that took her and transported her over a vast distance in the blink of an eye. I remember this being back in 2012. I was on patrol along the Mississippi River just outside of St. Louis. The area I was patrolling is considered one of the most haunted areas in all the United States. We get a lot of reports from people who see things like ghosts and whatnot. So at about 4 am, dispatch received a call from a frantic lady who was talking about seeing a man with glowing red eyes and huge fangs coming out of the woods towards her house. Now, 
This woman specifically was known to be on medications that cause paranoia and schizophrenia, so we initially thought it might have been some kind of hallucination brought on by her medication. But she sounded panicked, telling us there might actually be something going on, and so we had to check it out. We arrived at the area she called from, a lone gravel road leading to an old farmhouse. As we got closer, I began getting this odd feeling like something bad was about to happen. When we got up to the house, you could see something or somebody appearing to be huddled behind an old tree stump near some bushes, but since it was dark, you couldn't make out who or what it was until we got close. As we got close enough, I could finally see who, or rather what, it was. At first, all I saw were two green eyes staring back at me with an expression that seemed like terror. I couldn't exactly tell what it was, other than it wasn't human but looked like some sort of ape or monkey. That's when it stood up, and it was easily 9 feet tall, looking like this thing could have attacked somebody and destroyed us. Its long brown hair kind of flung off its body, and it had pointed ears on top of its head. But what really caught me off guard, initially hiding behind the stump, was its long snout and large fangs. I thought this might have been some sort of rabid bay or something, but I have never been filled with so much terror before in my life. This thing jumps up in the tree instantly and then leaps back toward us in a pouncing motion, swiping one of its claws. A second one of these creatures steps out of the woods right by where the first one attacked and begins to run towards us. My partner and I fire a couple of shots as these things give chase, and we quickly dart back to our vehicle. They all dart off back into the swamps. We had to go get back up, and we realized that this situation wasn't safe. This was not the last time that we encountered what we like to call the wolves of the Everglades. In fact, there's a much longer version, which I'll probably share with you in a separate email. But for now, I don't think these creatures are innocent. I believe that this woman was not just on her medication, these things were truly trying to break into her house and who knows what they would have done to her. How they got and remains a mystery. I found myself panting heavily as I leaned against a tree trunk, my heart pounding in my chest. The events of the night had left me shaken to the core, my mind struggling to comprehend the horrors we had just witnessed. It all began when our group of amateur hikers, led by our fearless adventurer Norris, stumbled upon an abandoned ranger station deep within Yellowstone National Park. The ranger station stood before us, weathered and worn by the passage of time. Its windows were shattered, and the door hung loosely on its hinges. Intrigued by the mysterious history that clung to the structure, we made the impulsive decision to spend the night, oblivious to the station's haunting past. As the sun dipped below the horizon, Casting an eerie glow over the surrounding forest, darkness fell upon us like a suffocating blanket. We gathered inside, our flashlights cutting through the thick veil of shadows that consumed the station. Unease settled upon our group, and an unspoken tension hung in the air. It began subtly, with faint whispers carried on the wind, disembodied voices that seemed to echo from the walls themselves. Goosebumps prickled along my arms as the ethereal sounds intensified, words I couldn't quite make out, but which carried an undeniable sense of anguish. Suddenly, ghostly apparitions flickered into existence before our startled eyes. Figures, translucent and hazy, materialized and disappeared in an instant. We caught glimpses of tormented souls, forever trapped in the realm between life and death, their sorrow etched into their spectral faces. A shudder ran down my spine as my gaze shifted toward the open doorway. Emerging from the darkness was a creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. It crouched, its long, emaciated arms hanging down against its sides, the skin stretched tight over the prominent ribs of its bony chest. What I had initially mistaken for white fur was, in fact, its sickly pale, death-like skin with eerie gray undertones. The creature's head was that of a human, but one ravaged by malnutrition and decay. Its hollow eyes were disproportionately large, reflecting the faint glimmers of sunlight, and they seemed to pierce through my very soul. With a guttural growl, 
It lunged toward us, teeth bared in a sinister snarl. Pure terror surged through our veins, overpowering our sense of curiosity. We turned and fled, racing into the night, driven solely by an instinct to survive. As we burst through the tree line into a small clearing, our heaving breaths were momentarily stilled by the sight of a park ranger jeep parked nearby. Relief flooded over us, and we quickly huddled together, sharing our terrifying encounter with the park ranger. But our hopes of finding solace and reassurance were shattered as he dismissed our story with a scoff. His eyes bore an expression of skepticism, and he chalked it up to hallucinations induced by drug use. We pleaded with him, our voices trembling with desperation, assuring him that we were clear-headed and what we had experienced was all too real. But the ranger remained unmoved, dismissing us as mere fools who had wandered into the realm of hallucinatory nightmares. Defeated and dejected, we trudged away from the ranger station, our minds forever scarred by the horrors we had faced. I was going through the hiking trails with my dog, behind my town's local high school, fairly late one night. I had gone there plenty of times before since I was young, so I wasn't frightened. While I was walking my dog, he kept trying to stop and was whimpering, which was strange, because he is normally a very brave dog. After walking for about 10 minutes longer, I heard huge branches crashing and breaking. That's when I started to become frightened and decided to turn back. While walking back, I could tell that something was following me. I was terrified. Suddenly, after a minute of calmness, this creature leapt in front of me, across the trail. The creature had long, dark fur and was enormous. It wasn't a bear. It was like a very muscular, huge wolf. After seeing this, I picked up my dog and sprinted off the trail, without seeing it again. That was easily one of the most terrifying nights of my life. This afternoon about 5 p.m. I had went to pick up my daughter from work. She works in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, right near the high school. I parked in the lot which is backed up to a little wooded-like area and was reading Facebook on my phone while I waited. I had this feeling of being watched come over me. I started looking around and turned in my seat to look into the trees to see if I saw anything and I saw this big dark figure standing there watching me. I turned back around in my seat hoping it didn't realize I seen it and lifted my phone up just enough to film it in my rear view mirror. You can see it moving around. It even stands up taller for a bit before ducking back down. I needed to see if I could get a better look cause I was starting to second guess myself and what I was seeing. As I opened my car door and stepped out I moved to the back of my car. And looked and I heard what sounded similar to a deep growl and it bolted into the trees. It was so fast I didn't get a good look at it. I cannot say 100% that what I'm looking at is a dog man but it's something let me know what you think. Since it was summer break for my school, I was lazily lounging at home watching TV. I got bored, so I went outside to see if I could do anything with my chickens, like feed them worms and snails. Before I go into more detail, I should explain the area I live in. My home is on the outskirts of the city I live in. I had about five or seven chickens at the time, and we hadn't expanded the coop, so it was a small pen connecting to two sides of the chicken coop, which is wooden and sturdy, the only ways to get into the coop is either through the trap door attached to the big door and the three windows, one window is on one side of the door and the second window on the other side. The third window is a large window. Keep in mind that they all have traps connected to them so they can be closed. We have seven acres of woodland that we call the back pasture, and if you've ever been back there you could see that it's a popular habitat for the local deer. There was also a wild boar that was roaming around at the time, and I don't know how it got there. We had been having trouble with poachers for a while, considering the population of deer in the woods. One poacher had set up a trail cam, one that was motion activated. There was an old rusty deer stand that had been put on a tree a long time ago, and the tree had begun to grow around it. 
Beyond our acres of woods, there's a large cornfield owned by our neighbors, and beyond that is a forest. I don't know what the forest is like beyond the field since we've never been there. I went outside to do something with my chickens, and I had brought along a bucket of corn for feeding the deer after. When I walked out of my home, I saw a doe was sitting in the tall grass, I thought it was sleeping since it had its head down and wasn't moving. I, being the curious little nut I was, decided that I would sneak up on the deer and get a picture of it to show to my mother when she got home from work. I crept as silently as I could across the yard that separated me from the deer. I should also mention that we have a clearing with a burn pit in it that was filled with cedar branches. I was creeping across my yard towards the deer, and when I had cleared the burn pit and was about 10 yards from it I realized that the deer wasn't asleep, but it was dead. It was the most disgusting sight I had ever seen. Its intestines were completely gone, the flesh on the body of the doe shredded to pieces and blood absolutely everywhere. It looked as if it had been sitting there for a while, and it smelled like it, too. Most of the blood was dried and the air reeked with the stench of rotting flesh, urine, and what seemed like a hint of wet dog. Something that creeped me out about the scene was although it was a rotting carcass, there were no insects at all around it, it was as if the usual lively forest was deader than the deer. Not even the neighbor's cattle made a sound. It looked as if the poor deer had simply been left after being brutally attacked and half-eaten, which it most likely was. I left the bucket at the beginning of the trail, thinking that I would come out later with my mother and grain the deer when she got home. Then, I started to walk back to my house. I had barely taken a few steps when I heard a low, snarling growl that sounded like a wolf. Although it seemed distorted as if it were being played on an old radio. Sorry, that's the only way I think of describing it. Against my better judgment, I turned my head around, and I saw what looked like the biggest freaking wolf I'd ever seen. It was on all fours, its fur was black and matted in places, its face was what you'd expect a wolf to look like, although it was broad and the muzzle seemed a little short. Although the way it was curling its lips made it look as if its snout was plenty long, and its eyes were yellow. Not a bright yellow like the yellow of a flower or the sun, but a dim, amber, red yellow, if that makes sense. Its ears looked like that of a Doberman pincer, with the cropped effect. Its front legs were long, and it looked as if it were a bodybuilder. Its paws, if you can even call them paws, looked like huge hands with long claws at the end of them. It stood up, and I heard the most sickening popping sound you could ever imagine. It sounded like the sound of popping joints, but it seemed amplified as if it were being played through a microphone and the sound was coming out of loudspeakers. Its body looked like a bodybuilder's pumped up on steroids, it was so big. It had no tail, that I could tell, and it seemed to tower over me. Although I was a good 10 meters from it. I was about 5 foot 4 inches at the time, and I came nowhere close to its height. It was so tall that the tip of its ears could almost touch the top of a young cedar. It let out a loud howl, which sounded more like a roar and it charged at me. Doing the only thing I knew to do while hyped up on fear and adrenaline, I began to run away from it. I remember clearing my yard in what seemed like hours but was most likely only a few seconds, and running inside. Slamming and locking all of the doors and windows. As I calmed down a small bit, I had realized that if it had really wanted to kill me that it would have. That what I had experienced was not an attack charge, but a bluff. I was lucky to get away with my life. Although this happened almost two years ago, it still terrifies me to think about it. The deer was gone the next day, and ever since that evening I have been weary around the woods, only going in them in broad daylight, only when I absolutely had to, and never without a weapon. Sadly, I cannot say that I am one of those people that have stopped experiencing things after the encounter, although I only had nightmares for a month after that day in June. Nothing really started to happen again until about two months ago when I was staying up at night playing on the laptop. I had started to hear things moving around on the porch and turned on the light to see the shape of something huge disappearing behind the corner of my house. 
There was also one of the rare times I went into the woods after the first encounter when I was helping my mother clear brush from the hunting clearing. I was going to get the mower, and was walking the trail to do so when I heard bipedal footsteps following me off to my side. They stopped whenever I stopped, and I eventually ran out of the woods and I haven't been back since. I asked my late great-grandmother about the creature I had seen in the woods, and she informed me that there was something called the wolf head man that stalked the Kansa tribe, preying on small children that strayed too far from their teepees. Later, I was informed by my history teacher that my house had actually been built on a tribal burial ground, and I have since been wondering if that had something to do with it. I hadn't heard about the wolf head man before she had told me about it. When I saw that there were several eyewitness reports that were proved to be truthful, it made me feel a lot better about coming out with this information. I had attempted to tell people previous to this submission, but everyone either said I was stupid, crazy, or just a plain liar. One thing's for certain, I am not stupid, I am not crazy, and I am most definitely not a liar. I know what I saw, and what I saw was a dog man. I think I had an encounter with Windigo. My friends and I recently went to Sierra National Forest for a camping trip. About two hours deep for dispersed camping. The day was wonderful, I personally ended up falling asleep fairly early, 10 am. When I woke up, half my group was in shambles from an unsettling story. Our campsite was all close together, however one of the individuals slept in a hammock about 50 feet from everyone else's tent. When we woke up, he had us if anyone else heard me scream his name. The strange thing here is I've referred to him by a personal nickname rather than his name for years. He had expressed to us that he heard the yell of his name, in my voice, around 3 am. And it sounded far away, however nobody else heard it. Just thought that was very strange. This happened about two weeks ago and we're still chatting about it as a collective. Four years ago, an unforgettable hunting trip took place, etched in my memory like a vivid painting. I was accompanied by my trusted companions, Uncle Jack, my brother Larry, and Frankie of Warm Springs, may he rest in peace. The season was perfect for elk hunting, with October to November casting a beautiful blend of colors over the landscape. Our destination was the wilderness near Mount Hood, a realm of nature's untamed majesty. We ventured off the beaten path, leaving the main road behind at the Bear Springs Ranger Station, and journeyed across the rugged ridges toward the McQuinn Strip, an addition of the Warm Springs Reservation. As we trekked through the dense forests and embraced the solitude of the wild, little did we know that an awe-inspiring and terrifying encounter awaited us. In the distance, around 800 yards away, we spotted an astonishing sight, two big feet in a meadow. Our hearts pounded with both amazement and trepidation. The massive creatures had apparently taken down an elk and were feasting on its flesh, tearing off chunks with ease. It was a sight that defied belief, mythical beings, as real as the wilderness surrounding us. As we watched through our rifle scopes, captivated by the scene unfolding before our eyes, another Bigfoot emerged from the brush to join the group. Moments later, a fourth one appeared, smaller in stature, but still an impressive five feet in height. The big feet ranged from seven feet tall to the smaller one at five feet, their presence alone enough to send shivers down our spines. While we were in awe of these magnificent creatures, our primal instincts kicked in, and we felt a growing concern for our own safety. If these majestic beings could so effortlessly take down an elk, could we be their next target? The idea of being on their menu for dessert was enough to send a chill down our spines, and with that realization, we chose to retreat. As we made our way back, Uncle Jack shared a story that added to the sense of awe and fear surrounding these mysterious beings. He recounted how a friend had witnessed Big Feet herding deer for the kill, illustrating their intelligence and cunning in securing a high-protein diet that sustained their impressive size, strength, agility, and speed. Our minds were swirling with questions and emotions as we hiked out of the wilderness. 
The encounter had left us both amazed and terrified, forever altering our perception of the untamed world around us. We had been privileged to glimpse these elusive giants of the forest, and yet, the lingering fear of what they were capable of haunted our thoughts. Since that fateful day, we continued our hunting trips, but the memory of the big feet remained etched in our minds, a constant reminder that the wild had secrets beyond our understanding. It was a chilly afternoon in the heart of the forest, and I was hiking along a scenic trail, enjoying the solitude and the beauty of nature. The rustling leaves under my boots and the distant chirping of birds created a peaceful ambience around me. Little did I know that this tranquil hike would lead me to an inexplicable encounter that would forever remain etched in my memory. As I trekked deeper into the wilderness, I noticed a tree line not far from the trail. My curiosity sparked, and I decided to venture closer to take a peek at the dense vegetation beyond. My heart skipped a beat when, from the corner of my eye, I saw a large figure moving amidst the trees. At first, I thought it was a bear, and my heart raced with a mix of excitement and fear. But as I focused on the creature, my astonishment grew. This was no ordinary bear, it was running on its hind legs. I rubbed my eyes, thinking I must be seeing things, but there it was, unmistakable. This creature was sprinting, its arms raised above its head like a human running in a race. My mind was a whirlwind of emotions and confusion. My instincts told me to retreat, but my curiosity held me in place, trying to comprehend the bizarre sight before me. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing, it defied everything I knew about bears. They don't run on their hind legs, do they? The creature continued its unusual dash along the tree line for what felt like an eternity but was probably only a few seconds. Then, as abruptly as it appeared, it vanished into the thick foliage. My heart pounded in my chest, and my mind raced with questions. What had I just witnessed? Was it a bear imitating human-like movements, or was it something entirely different? I cautiously made my way back to the main trail, my thoughts consumed by the enigmatic encounter. As I returned to civilization, I couldn't shake off the image of that strange creature. Later that day, I decided to share my story with a few fellow hikers and locals. To my surprise, I was met with skepticism and disbelief. People often mistake things in the woods, they said, bears don't run on their hind legs. I nodded, trying to accept their rational explanation, but deep down, I knew what I saw was real. The memory of that bear-like creature, running on its hind legs with its arms raised above its head, remained vivid in my mind. During the summer of 1987, I was hiking with eight other teens and three adult instructors in the Three Sisters Wilderness in Oregon. We were heading up a low ridge around dusk, over to the left and towards the base there was a small pond and as we reached the top there wad a small lake to the right down the other side of the ridge. The instructors set up camp further up the ridge about 50 yards from us. We were setting up our tarps and collecting water for the night, making dinner act. The sun was down but it was still light enough to see clearly for maybe 30 more minutes. Alex went to relieve himself, and we could still see the instructors up the hill from us. When all of a sudden a rock about the size of a bowling ball came flying into our camp. We were shocked, then started yelling at Alex. Knock it off, et cetera. Then another one came and another. The rocks were not too close to us but close enough to be somewhat of a danger. Then Alex came back, we all got in his face and were really upset, then another rock came down. We all ran up to where the instructors were at, and told them what happened. They of course thought we were full of it, when from out of nowhere again came Anther Rock not so close but again close enough. It is getting quite dark now and all sat back to back in a circle, with our ice axes in our hands. I think we stayed up all night, but the next day we all just left and never spoke about it again. About 10 years ago I was living with my aunt and I basically had the basement family room to myself. 
The house setup was odd because the basement had its own entrance, which was really ground level, and the rest of the house was built into or onto a hill. In order to walk in the formal front door you would have to go up a flight of stairs, but right off the driveway was the basement door. The house is old, and the lock on the basement door is tricky, and there have been many nights when I just went to sleep and forgot to, or didn't lock the door right, it had to be slammed shut, etc. One night I awake from sleep in a distressed panic, as if I was having a nightmare, but I didn't, to the best of my knowledge, have a nightmare. Basically it felt like something bad was transpiring. As I lay in bed I could hear someone tinkering with the basement lock and door. I listen to verify, and then it becomes painfully aware that someone is outside, trying to get in. I walk over to the door slowly, and look out the peephole but I can't see anything because it is way too dark outside. There is a switch to turn on the floodlight about 4 feet from the door so I switch it on and quickly get to the peephole to see who is out there. When I look through the peephole I see a middle-aged, bald, somewhat husky white male but I can't see his face because he is looking back at where the light is, I guess he was checking to see who put a light on him, or what was going on, I run upstairs, wake up my family, grab a golf club and call the police. They take 30 minutes to get there, shine a spotlight around the yard and leave. I didn't get any sleep that night. I spend a lot of time hunting by myself in the American Southwest, mainly Arizona. I am always armed and this story will explain why. I was three days into a week-long predator hunt. I mainly hunt coyote but also buy a mountain lion permit, as they frequent the area and often respond to my predator calls. I awoke one night in my camp to voices around the perimeter of my camp. They were all in Spanish and in a hushed tone but in the desert, noise travels very far. I was sleeping in my pickup truck camper but had the windows open for ventilation. I awoke to the voices and quietly readied my sidearm in case they were smugglers or someone looking to rob me. I waited for what felt like hours in the darkness but really was maybe 20 minutes. After a time I decided to investigate instead of fall back asleep. As quietly as I could I put on my boots and grabbed my rifle and peered around me. The moon was half full and the sky clear so I could see a great distance around me. I saw four figures huddled around the remains of my campfire using it to heat some sort of pot or can as food or water. I waited inside my truck, trying not to move as I didn't know their intentions. After about a half hour they quietly moved on in the northern direction but I never fell back asleep. I waited until dawn before going back to sleep and reported them to the border patrol agent on my way out of the range. I never saw any footprints or signs that they were even there the next morning, only a small depression in my fire where their pot or can had sat. Other than that they were gone without a trace. I assumed they were just people crossing the border illegally to find work or trafficking drugs but I never knew for certain. I shudder to think what would have happened if I had confronted them as I don't know if they were armed or not. I don't go hunting alone anymore. Eight years ago, I found myself in Bend, Oregon, a place that seemed to harbor whispers of the unknown. As I explored the charming town, I stumbled upon an intriguing tale that would ignite my curiosity and lead me on an adventure I could never have imagined. I had the chance to strike up a conversation with a lady who had camped near Paulina Peak, a majestic peak that stood tall at 7,897 feet. The thought of camping amidst such breathtaking scenery excited me, but it was her story that truly captured my attention. She recounted a night, eight years prior, when her peaceful camping trip took an unexpected turn. In the early morning hours, a blood-curdling scream echoed through the wilderness. The sound was like nothing she had ever heard before, and it sent shivers down her spine. Frightened and perplexed, she decided to share her experience with the local forest service rangers from the Deschutes National Forest. The rangers were attentive as she described the terrifying scream she had heard. They revealed to her a plaster cast of a Bigfoot track, 
left by a creature that had been spotted crossing a road by two of the rangers themselves. With conviction, they assured her that the scream she heard was probably from the very creature that left that intriguing track. Intrigued and captivated, I was eager to learn more about this mysterious encounter. I sought to track down the retired ranger who had witnessed the Bigfoot track, hoping to hear more about this enigmatic creature roaming the woods of Oregon. However, my efforts to follow this lead were met with obstacles. The Forest Service personnel seemed tight-lipped, unwilling to share any further information. So basically I was with a group of friends walking from one condominium to another, there was a forest between these condominiums, with a fence dividing it from the sidewalk. I was behind the group with one of my friends, we were walking through a slightly dark part of the street and suddenly both us saw some some white thing in one of the trees, it looked like a slime and it was moving in a really weird way, had no legs, no face, and it was a really powerful white, like there's no chance it was a light or something else, I called for the other guys and as I shouted it started climbing really fast in a really bizarre way as if I scared it, I turned on the lights from the phone to see if I could find it but honestly I was scared too and my heart started beating fast, so I just started running away with my friend. It was so good to have him there, cause we talked later and both of us saw the same thing and even complimented each other as we talked, so I was sure I was not hallucinating. Of course none of our friends who were in front of us believed in what we said, some of them got intrigued but I wouldn't blame them for not believing it, as I wouldn't blame you, it was really strange, it was like that venom slime but white, it's my only encounter with something that I just can't explain what it was, it really looked like it was not from earth. Edit, just thought as the post got some attention I figured I should give an update. First off wanted to thank everyone that participated, I didn't know this subreddit, Never participated that much on Reddit but I've read some interesting posts here and I'll probably stay around, I don't think I'll ever post any other story here again, at least hope so. Wanted to thank in special the two guys who shared their stories seeing this white thing, have talked to other people about this, but people either don't take it seriously or just have no idea of what it is when I describe. I went back to place today around 2 p.m. to see if there's anything there but unfortunately just found nothing, I still have no idea what it was and I may never know, all I can do now is wait if more people from these condominiums will notice it. Cause I swear on everything, that thing is not an animal, that is just beyond science. My husband bought me a voodoo doll a couple birthdays ago in New Orleans. It was a vampire to keep you safe at night. I thought it was cute, but I did not put too much stock in it being real. Anyway, fast forward to a couple weeks ago. For some backstory, my husband was a boy scout. He has no fear of the wilderness and is strictly a don't worry until you have to person. We had been camping for several days at this point so I was not spooked either. It was a very normal, happy night. When we arrived at this campsite, I got the idea to grab our vampire. We normally keep him hanging in our car. He would not budge. I'm talking my husband and I both tried to get this clip to open for a good 10 minutes, and it just wouldn't. We thought maybe it had melted together in the heat, joke that he needs to stay in the car for some reason we are unaware of, and we went about our day. Fast forward several hours, we are in our tent at Sipsy Wilderness with our kids just hanging out after they went to sleep. With no prompt, no scary rustling in the bushes, no bad feeling, nothing, I get the urge to ask my husband if he's scared. I suddenly feel my hair standing up. He says yes. Without even talking to each other about what we should do, we both instantly grabbed the kids and ran for what felt like our lives to the car. Toss the still sleeping kids in the back seat, my husband buckling them in the car as I'm driving away. I'm big on car seat safety, but I didn't even wait. I just had a feeling we had seconds to get out of there. We didn't even get a chance to discuss what was going on when a random car passes us leaving the empty campsite. This is 2 AM in the freaking remote wilderness in nowhere Alabama. The entire campsite was empty that whole day. 
I just drive faster at this point leaving all our belongings behind. We arrive at the closest Walmart, maybe a 30 minutes drive, and the employees are outside. Walmart is closed. Seriously there are about 10 employees outside just staring blankly at our car. If anyone has an explanation for this please let me know. It was eerie, but this may not be anything. I guess there might be overnight stocking where 10 employees are taking a smoke break or something at the same time, but it just seemed off. We parked in the lot away from the employees as not to spook them, but they just kept staring. They didn't speak to each other or move. I decided to keep driving. I felt like I was in the twilight zone. I had no idea what to do at this point, so we just kept driving around and napped in the car with keys and ignition ready to book it if we needed to until the sun came up. We returned to the campsite, packed our stuff as fast as we could, and we never went back. We have since spent all our camping time at Chiha with no instances like this one. The weirdest part? That next morning, my husband tested our voodoo doll clip, and he came right off the car immediately. It's almost like he refused to leave our car that night to keep us safe. This probably doesn't explain everything the way it actually happened to us, but in summary, we got a really weird urge to run, saw some weird stuff, and now I'm afraid to go back to Sipsy. What do y'all think? So I was hunting with my dad up in the mountains a few years back and we had called it a night and returned to camp. After more than a few beers and some whiskey we went to bed. Now we weren't sleeping in tents or anything, just some ancient army cots under the stars. After dosing off I hear our old ice chest open and then thud shut, and that old ice chest had a very loud and squeaky hinges so it was very noticeable. I assumed it was my dad getting a water bottle. A few seconds later it happens again and repeats a few more times. So I turn over to ask my dad how is he so drunk that he can't operate an ice chest to find he's still asleep and snoring next to me. I reach for my mag light and shine it on the ice chest to find a black bear rummaging through it, he takes one look at me and runs off with something while I yell at him. Later the next day we find the bottle of Crown Royal a few feet away from camp unopened. We always share a laugh about that alcoholic bear. Hi, everyone. I don't normally make posts like this but this is a very strange occurrence that I just had the urge to share. I do consider myself spiritual, but I am in no way religious or actively practicing anything. Yesterday, I was in my bedroom with my younger sister and I was braiding her hair. It was taking a long time and I really had to use the bathroom, so I told her to give me a minute and I walked out. It's important to keep in mind I didn't tell her where I was going, what I was doing, or how long I would be gone. I just got up and went straight to the bathroom. I was in there for about 10 minutes because I had gotten into an argument with my friend over text, which is important to note because it doesn't normally take me long to use the bathroom. After I'm finished, I walk out of the bathroom to wash my hands, our sink is on the outside. When I walked out, I was in direct view of my sister because the sink is across from my bedroom door. As I was washing my hands, I noticed she was staring at me with a perplexed look on her face so I asked her what was wrong. She calmly asks me how I could have walked out the bathroom. This was a very oddly worded question so I asked her what she meant. She asked me, weren't you just in the living room? And I told her no, I've been in the bathroom the whole time. My sister began to look very sick as she told me I just talked to you in the living room, when did you walk in the bathroom? In a very concerned tone, I insisted to her that I did not enter the living room, and since I had gotten up and walked out of my bedroom, there was no point in which I had entered the living room. I asked her what I had said to her when she saw me in the living room. She tells me that she saw me sitting on the couch with my hands neatly folded, and I was staring off into space. She then told me that I had a very disturbed and concerned look on my face, which prompted her to ask me what was wrong, to which she claims I responded nothing in an eerie tone. My sister claims that she the me she had seen looked just like me. My hair was in a loose bun, 
I was wearing my same grey shirt and old red pajama pants, my face was the same, everything was the same. But it wasn't me. I know it wasn't me because I have no recollection of that happening. I was in the bathroom the entire time distracted by my heated discussion. I have no idea how this happened, but my sister told me after our exchange she felt nauseous, like something was off. I'm not sure what to make of this. I am a pretty rational person and have heard stories like this before. I want to look into possible carbon monoxide poisoning because it has been known to cause hallucinations, however, only my sister has experienced this. Neither me nor my roommate have seen anything out of the ordinary. We've been theorizing about parallel universes, possession, demons, curses. But we really don't know what's going on and are just looking for some answers. On my first and only backcountry hike, me and two much more experienced friends set up camp at 9,000 feet in the southern Sierra Nevada. The first day we saw a black bear cub wandering around the other side of a small lake, which was a little tense, but we didn't see any other bears the rest of the hike. That night, we all ate and then crashed early, but I'm a light sleeper and the altitude was messing with me. As I'm trying to read with my headlamp, I start to hear some low moaning sounds. It sounded like the groaning movie sound effects when a huge storm is brewing close to a ship as the winds whipped up. After a few minutes, I called out from my tent to my two friends, what the F is that? Not completely sure it wasn't a bear. They both immediately acknowledge they are alarmed as well. We all open our tent flaps and just watch as the winds get stronger and stronger. The trees at our altitude were sparse but there were a few huge ones circling our site. The ground we were on was mostly settled granite slag and boulders, and we were 1000 feet from the top of a very long and very narrow canyon, probably a half mile wide, there's probably a better geographic term for it. There were five of these canyons all descending from a 10,000 foot peak. This sound increased until the wind picked up enough to tell us it was a huge storm of some kind. No clouds, no rain, just torrential winds. The wind at our ground level was not extreme, but the sound of what was going on above us was insane. Every now and then a blast of wind would shudder through our campsite, but the tops of the trees above us were swaying so severely that the trunks were moaning as loud as a car going by. Debris was falling all around us, big enough to render us all silent, even though we could hear each other, because there was nothing we could do. I will never forget that sound. It almost sounded like a huge steel tanker crashing against rocks, with a low growl and a high-pitched squeal. With every growl came a huge gust of wind that plunged down the rocky slope in a vortex that passed maybe a hundred feet over our heads. I'll never forget watching those tree tops bend to a frightening angle and then the residual blast of air that hit a few seconds later. This is a story from my mother and younger sister, who I will refer to as S in this post. It happened in Brooklyn, New York in the late 90s. I was in the second or third grade, S was around four years old. We had a back porch, overlooking a small fenced yard and lawn. We'd get the occasional regular-sized praying mantis. According to S, one day she was playing in the yard, while my mom was hanging laundry up on the back porch. Apparently, this thing just suddenly materialized right there in the middle of the yard. Because S says she turned around and there it was. She just stared at it for a few moments, not sure if it was a toy or what. She said it looked like a two and a half to three foot long, praying mantis with big red eyes and tiny black pinpricks for pupils. When the fear finally hit her, S ran up the stairs shouting for mom. All she could express at the time was that it was a big bug. My mom barely reacted OFC because kids get scared by normal bugs all the time. Well, the damn thing followed S up the stairs. For so long I've imagined what that must have looked like. S convinced my mom to go inside with her. That's when mom finally saw it. While she and S were watching it from inside through the mesh door, the praying mantis perched itself in one of the chairs on the porch. 
Not like on the top of the back cushion or on the arm rest or something, just in the chair proper. When my mom went looking for a camera, all at once it just disappeared. I asked if it flew away but neither of them have an answer. It was gone as instantly as it showed up. When my dad brought me home from school around a half hour later they were still hiding behind the mesh door looking terrified. I never got this full version of the story till S was older. For years she would become hysterical if she ever saw a praying mantis or even the image of one. I wonder about what this thing could have been or why it only showed itself to mom and S. I do know, however, that as I got older I found that my mother was a very abusive woman and S, I believe, suffered the most because of it. Makes me wonder if one of the people I've told this story to is right about it being a demon. Or at least a bad omen. About seven years ago, Camping with my future wife by a small lake a few lakes over into Crown Land. Government owned, but not park land in Canada, near my family cottage. We'd cleared a bit of brush right on the shore of the lake for our tent, set up camp, ate, hung our food, and went into the tent to sleep. Middle of the night I wake up to the sound of something huge moving through the bush nearby. It got closer and closer, and sped up a bit, crashed through some brush probably no more than four to five feet from the tent and kept going. Eventually close to daybreak we did get back to sleep, and in the morning we found a trail of trampled bush and unknown scat not far from where we were sleeping. This happened to me and my then roommate a few years ago. We were just chilling on the couch and listening to the rain outside when at one point we started talking about how the rain sounded like the sea, and how we pictured a lighthouse on a windy shore. I know this sounds crazy and maybe like we were on drugs, but we were not, we were completely sober. Slowly but surely the conversation between my friend and I started to shift to a visualization, or perhaps a hypnosis? It's unclear to me how this normal conversation about a lighthouse turned into the shared vision or dream it did, but at one point we were both there, in the lighthouse. We both saw a man there, dressed in a yellow raincoat. He had a weathered face and a grey beard, but most remarkably in the place where his eyes were supposed to be there were two black holes, as if they had been gauged out and only some rotting black skin remained. We both felt this intense urge to get out so we ran away from the lighthouse to the woods as he followed us. I'm not sure about how we woke up from this hypnosis, dream, vision or whatever it was but I remember realizing this was bad and we needed to wake up. So I urged my roommate to do so. After I returned to my body I gently woke them up and we discussed what happened. When we had entered this state it was around 12 midnight, But when we woke up it was about 3 am yet it felt like we had only been doing this for 15 minutes. The next day we both secretly drew the man we saw, we were both illustration students, without having discussed what he looked like. We drew the exact same man and had given him the exact same name, the Wehrman. My question is, what was this? A state of hypnosis we entered through the rain? Folie à deux? Or something supernatural? If so, does anyone recognize a figure of a lighthouse keeper in a yellow raincoat with no eyes? I worked at a state park and would regularly go days without seeing another person when my boss went away. So my boss was away one week and left his dog with me, and I was wasting time around my lunch break throwing tennis balls for him. I threw one really far away into the woods to give myself some time to eat my sandwich, and a maybe 10 minutes later he comes bounding out of the woods and drops this. Jaw right at my feet. I didn't touch it, but it was this grayish mass of skin and bone with bits of torn pink flesh underneath. Then it had about 7 or 8 of these long, thin, and very sharp teeth sticking out of its strange angles along the jawbone. It wasn't bloody, so it wasn't something the dog had killed, and it stank so it was probably old. I left it on the concrete where the dog had dropped it, took him with me and spent a little bit of time searching around in the woods in the direction he had come back, which was unnerving, 
but I didn't find anything. Then when I went back to where I had left it, it was just gone, and suddenly the dog started growling at the woods and his hackles went up. Right then I got in my truck, dog jumped in back, and I went home for the day. When my uncle was in his teens and early twenties he used to go on a yearly backpacking trip in the mountains of the Pacific Northwest near Mount Baker National Forest with a group of friends. They, there were five of them, knew each other from high school and over the years as they went their separate ways in life, college, etc. The trip became a way for them to reconnect with one another. Anyway, the first time they made this backpacking trip they were cresting a peak and came across a wide valley view. They were off trail and making pace cross country, but could navigate well enough given geography, my uncle in particular is a pretty experienced outdoorsman, and was even back then. To their surprise, especially given that there weren't any trails nearby for at least a couple miles, the group saw a large house on the side of a small lake. There was a small water plane parked on a dock adjacent the house, but other than this everything was entirely wild, no trails, no campsites, nothing. The group was shocked, but didn't think much of it the first time. It seemed to be a pretty rad house, so they assumed it belonged to some rich somebody and that it was just a private retreat. It was still pretty cool though, so they decided to return to that mountain crest every time they went on this trip to look at the house. Well, three or four years later when they came across the house there was no plane on the dock. They figured this meant that nobody was home. This time, they decided, they were going to check out the house. So they made their way down, which took a while through the thick, trailless forest. What they came to was a remarkably fancy modern style cabin home. Three floors, huge windows, a massive deck with a state-of-the-art barbecue. Everything one would want in a sick-ass hidden mountain retreat. Cool. While they were poking around, a plane landed. Instead of running and hiding, the group decided to explain the situation. So they did when they met a nice gentleman who had flown in. He was very kind and courteous and pleased to show them his vacation house. From then on each time they went on the trip they would stop there for a night if the plane was present. Only one year my uncle became curious. What's the deal with this place? So at night, while they were sleeping in the house, he crept around and investigated a few of the many rooms it had. In the basement he found what explains everything. Massive piles of weed and brick form stacked row upon row next to stacks of cash. Instead of freaking out, he went back to sleep, and didn't tell his friends until they had left the next day. Not exactly spooky, but I feel like it fits in with the vibe of this threat. A few years back my fiancé and I went up to stay at her parents' property in Northern California for a weekend to camp, hike, do some astrophotography and generally just enjoy nature. This place is a good 20 minutes from any real town, and far enough from any big city that you can faintly see the glow of the Milky Way at night. The property is pretty huge and has a cabin, but we both prefer sleeping out under the stars so we set an air mattress in the bed of my truck and pulled it up next to the pond. We got there a little after 3 in the afternoon and after getting everything set up, we decided to go for a walk. This being just a quick walk, I left my phone, wallet, keys, etc. in my backpack to avoid any distractions, even for just a little bit. When we got back about a half hour later, I noticed that my backpack was zipped open and laying on its side. I was sure that I left it zipped up and standing up. I was concerned and brought it up to my fiancé, but she convinced me that I probably just remembered wrong, as I sometimes do. The night goes on and some clouds roll in, ruining our chance to stargaze, so we decided to get to bed a little sooner than normal to get an earlier start the next morning. After some wilderness sexy times we hit the hay. Sometimes I have trouble sleeping at night, so while she sleeps I'm often left laying there for an hour or so until I'm actually out. It's never bothered me too much, but this night in particular I remember wishing I could have just fallen asleep. A little while after we both went to bed, 
I heard something splashing in the pond next to us. I didn't think much of it, probably just a small animal, maybe a deer. Worst case scenario, maybe it was a mountain lion, but I've heard they don't bother campers all that often anyways, so I wasn't worried. It wasn't until I heard the word hey from somewhere across the pond that I was legitimately freaked out. My heart was beating out of my chest. I turned my head to see that my fiancé was still fast asleep, which was good, because I don't even want to imagine how she would have reacted. I laid in silence for what felt like hours, but probably just about 5 seconds later I heard the word hey again. This time it was a little closer than before, and I knew it wasn't just the wind or my ears playing tricks on me. I was backpacking the river to river trail alone and was staying the night at one horse gap in Shawnee Forest. I set up my campsite and did a little exploring around the area walking along a cliff edge. I came back, started a fire, and ate some crappy freeze-dried meal. It's almost 10 and I'm looking at the stars and I hear from the area I was exploring earlier this loud animal noise, it sounded like a monkey howling. I'm not an expert in animal sounds, but I do know most of the sounds in that area, since I hiked them quite frequently, and I had no idea what it was. I went into my tent shortly after and started to go to sleep when I heard, probably within 100 feet of my tent, a sound like a single big footstep. No worries, probably a deer. Then, I heard it again a few minutes later and again a few minutes later. Then I heard several steps back to back getting closer. My mind was racing what it could be, but since I was alone I was prone to freak out a little more. So I just told myself to calm down it's just a deer. Then I hear the noise of something dropping on the rock I'm camping on. I'm on the side of a small cliff and the tree line is about 10 feet away, then I hear it again. It sounded like rock hitting rock, like the rocks were getting thrown at me. It happened a few more times and then one hit my tent. At that moment I'm convinced it's a Samsquanch. I peek out the netting at the top of my tent and scream as loud as I can hey. After that I didn't hear anything, rocks or footsteps. And I just wanted to go to sleep so I wouldn't freak out anymore. I told myself it just had to be acorns falling from the trees and eventually got to sleep. So the next morning I got out of my tent and inspected the ground. There are no acorns or pine cones or anything but rocks on the ground. I'm still telling myself it couldn't have been the rocks because they would have to have been thrown. But I pick up a rock throw it in the air and let it hit and it was the exact same noise I heard the night before. I packed it up and noped out of there. I was talking on my cell at the end of my sidewalk by the street when I turned around facing my house and saw this huge black human-like bird thing gliding without a noise coming from the east maybe the distance would be like three streets over but about maybe five blocks down. When I saw this I was stunned and stared at it trying to figure out what it was and then I realized it wasn't anything I've ever seen. I ran into the house and yelled at my husband and my grown son to get out here quick. They came but seemed like forever and they looked and saw it too. When they saw it the thing was like the a few streets over and then disappeared behind the big trees. When we saw it we all said that no one would believe us, but I have recently been talking about it because it has bothered me so much. I've lived in this neighborhood all my life and I can remember three UFO sightings since I was five and all the sightings were in this neighborhood or around Stinson Field Airport. I never came forward about them because people think you've lost your ever-loving mind until recently when others I've spoke with shared their experiences. I have other stories but this one is the most recent and I was wondering if anyone has ever seen this thing. It is silent like it was a glider but I could see the body was exactly like a man a very large man. I live in Sweden and a few years back I lived with my parents whose house is in a small village in the middle of the woods, so there is plenty of wildlife around. It was in the middle of the winter and pretty much the whole village had gathered at a hut down by the lake to grill and have a nice time. It was about 8pm and it was dark as shit and I wanted to go home and play Skyrim, 
So I left and began the 2 km walk home only having my phone to light the path. After 1 km I heard something. It was a deep panting. It was way too deep to be a neighboring dog and I remembered someone mentioning earlier that wolves had been seen near the village. I tried to keep my cool and kept walking in the same pace, trying to spot whatever was running a few meters away from me, breathing loudly, but the light was too weak to spot anything. At this point I was freaking out a little inside and picked up a large tree branch and carried it with me like a weapon, just in case. The thing ran beside me for a hundred meters, then disappeared. When I hadn't heard it for a few seconds I ran as fast as I could the few hundred remaining meters. I never got to know if it was a wolf, Bigfoot, crawler or any other cryptid or not. Because it began to snow soon after, covering the tracks. And after checking with the neighbors I know it wasn't a dog. That's probably the most scared I've ever been. I encountered a huge, brilliant red light while finishing my rounds as a security guard. It hovered above some trees near a construction site. Curiosity compelled me to investigate further, leading me closer to the site. There, I discovered a large saucer-shaped object with a hump in the center bottom section, surrounded by a vibrant red light. As I approached, a low whirring sound reached my ears, and the object descended, landing on a tripod-like gear. To my surprise, a stairway-like protrusion extended towards the ground. A figure emerged from the craft and began descending. The humanoid stood at an impressive height of 8 feet, with long, dangling arms, a massive torso, and short, stump-like legs. Its face was elongated and oval-shaped, with two tear-shaped eyes that captured my attention. An eerie sensation gripped me as the creature moved towards me with high, loping steps. I felt a strong humming inside my skull and caught a whiff of an odor reminiscent of rotten eggs. Just then, a passing car on the road behind me caught the creature's attention. It abruptly retreated and swiftly boarded the object, which rapidly took off and vanished into the sky. Randy Morganson was an experienced backcountry ranger, having worked 28 seasons in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. He was intimately familiar with the High Sierra Wilderness, having explored it more than any other ranger. Dedicated to his job, Randy took his responsibilities seriously. On a summer day in 1996, Randy left a note on his tent, stating that he would be away for two or three days. Strangely, the date on the note was June 21st, not July 21st. Carrying only his backpack, he departed from near Bench Lake, leaving behind his Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum at camp. Unfortunately, Randy never returned, and he was never seen alive again. Randy Morganson was one of many seasonal rangers who had been reapplying for their jobs every summer, with no medical benefits or retirement plan. They were a tight-knit group, referred to as the 14ers, as they had been returning to the park for over a decade, some even for two decades. Their reward was not monetary, but rather the beauty of the sunsets they witnessed. If a ranger were to die in service, their family would receive a one-time payment of $100,000, but no pension. Randy had written in his 1973 McClure Meadow Log, expressing his longing for adventure and the freedom to find his own path. Randy's life took a downturn as the 1996 season approached. His wife, Judy, decided not to join him on backcountry adventures after he had an affair with a fellow ranger named Lilinus. Randy's spirits were low, and he questioned the worth of his job after years of service. The divorce papers from Judy arrived, adding to his emotional burden. Randy's friends noticed his mood decline, and he confided in them about his thoughts of S. Then, on July 20, 1996, he contacted his colleague and his wife on the radio, asking trivial questions. Their conversation abruptly ended with Randy stating, I won't be bothering you two anymore. The next day, Randy left his camp without a trace. The community was haunted by the mystery of Randy's disappearance.
The circumstances left many questions unanswered. Was it an accident? Foul play? Or something more inexplicable, like an encounter with aliens? The search and rescue efforts were relentless, with rangers scouring the area for any sign of Randy. The search leader utilized a computer program called CASI, Computer Aided Search Information Exchange, to track the effectiveness of each segment searched. However, weeks passed with no leads, and morale began to decline. The rangers were determined to find their beloved colleague before it was too late. Ranger Rick Sanger, a second-year backcountry ranger, hiked through the night to Randy's duty station at Bench Lake. There, he discovered a note confirming Randy's overdue status from a cross-country patrol. Anxiety grew as everyone wondered what had happened to their veteran mentor. The investigation into Randy's disappearance uncovered two separate threats of violence made against him. However, neither person had an alibi for the time of Randy's disappearance, leaving the case without a clear suspect. Speculation ran rampant. After 13 days of searching, hope started to dwindle. Then, in a remote gorge, five years later, a worker stumbled upon fresh evidence. It was a breakthrough. Rangers were summoned, and they discovered Randy's shirt bearing his badge, his backpack, and a boot half submerged in water. Excitement turned to horror when a leg bone was found in the boot. The evidence matched Randy's reported gear. Despite the discovery, the search for answers continued. Retired Sierra Subdistrict Ranger Alden Nash believed that Randy had stumbled through a fragile snow bridge and fallen into an icy abyss, breaking his leg. He theorized that Randy's body remained hidden beneath the snow for days while search parties combed the area. Judy Morganson received a letter after Randy's disappearance, but it arrived two days later. This added confusion to the mystery. The search for Randy yielded no definitive answers, leaving his family and colleagues yearning for closure. Randy Morganson's fate remains a haunting mystery. Speculation and theories abound, but the truth eludes everyone. Despite the passage of time, the unanswered questions surrounding Randy's disappearance linger, forever reminding us of his enigmatic vanishing. My nickname is Detective Mark Smith. I'm a civil servant working in the South Carolina State Park Service Police Department. Recently, while on patrol at Santee State Park, I encountered an individual who claims to be part of the Lizard Man Task Force. It was approximately midnight when dispatch had sent us to investigate reports of somebody screaming from inside the park. We immediately responded. As we neared the location where the screams were last heard, our vehicle malfunctioned, losing all power along with most electrical equipment. This forced us to continue on foot, following what appeared to be abandoned tire tracks leading into a heavily wooded area. The tracks seemed to belong to a mid-sized 4x4 or SUV-type vehicle. We continued on foot as the screams, sounding like a young child pleading for help from something unknown, grew closer. Suddenly, the screams ceased, replaced by the growling sound of an unknown creature. I caught a glimpse of yellow eyes staring at us before it swiftly ran into the night. It took about an hour to find another officer who arrived with a tow truck to pull our car back onto the road. We then contacted dispatch to have it towed away for repair. By now, it was 2.18 am, and we headed back to the station, feeling frustrated, tired, and somewhat scared. Upon our return, dispatch informed us of reports of another officer down, whom I'll call Officer James. Apparently, he had been attacked by a large unknown animal. As we rushed to the scene, more screams were heard from a nearby neighborhood. People there were having their own encounters with this creature. We split into two teams, realizing the extreme aggression and danger this creature posed. Our equipment malfunctioned, causing delays in regrouping. Fortunately, all officers were physically unharmed, but shaken. They described an eight-foot-tall creature with glowing yellow eyes, resembling a giant walking lizard. When we fired at it, the creature growled in a demonic tone and disappeared into the woods. Realizing the abnormal nature of the situation, 
we knew we needed to reassess our approach. We discovered massive footprints near where Officer James had been attacked. He was seriously injured and had to wait for help to arrive. That night, we first heard about the beings linked to the Lizard Man sightings, which had occurred across the state over the years. After that night, the details become hazy in my memory. However, I found myself taking a friend into Santee State Park to show him something called the Ritual Site. He believed it was connected to the Lizard Man or some sort of cult. We ventured into the woods, reaching an area where the attacks had occurred near the Ritual Site. Suddenly, something large jumped out, with the same height and glowing eyes. It attacked my friend and knocked me unconscious in the process. When I woke up, I searched for my friend for hours, but he was nowhere to be found. Desperate, I approached a park ranger and explained what had happened. He suggested seeking more police assistance at the Santee State Park Ranger Station, as they were experiencing more encounters with this creature. When we arrived at the station, the sheriff explained that they had been receiving numerous sightings of the lizard man. It became evident that the creature was very, very real. My family has a summer house on a large remote island. Our place is in the most lightly inhabited part, and to get to it you either have to sail or fly and then either hike over extremely steep terrain, so steep that on the downhill side one has to hang onto trees and bracken and go hand over hand and half slide down, for about 3 hours or travel for around 40 minutes in a little open topped boat at high tide. There are no roads or utilities. There are some other houses around but they are far apart and one has to walk through thick bush on tiny narrow tracks for at least 10 to 15 minutes to get to a neighbor. There are no lights and while the stars and moon are very bright, on a cloudy night you literally cannot see your hand in front of your face. It's incredibly remote and mostly incredibly idyllic. Long childhood summers running wild through the forest and playing in the streams. There are some incredibly creepy things about it though. Story 1. There is a grave at the entrance to the river. It's been there since the 1800s and is a light colored stone with a white picket fence around it. The woman buried there was one of the original settlers of the area. When I was a child, the grave had fallen into disrepair. Strange things started happening all around the houses in the area. Doors slamming without a breeze, funny noises, taps turning on and off by themselves, little things going missing and weird problems with boat motors with no explanation. After a while, the community got sick of it and someone suggested it had something to do with the grave. After laughing it off, everyone decided it wouldn't hurt to clean up the grave. They went out one day, weeded, scrubbed the stone, painted the fence, said a few words and all the weird happenings stopped. Story 2. There are places that just feel wrong all over the area. There are no dangerous creatures on the island other than potentially wild pigs and it's always the same places. It makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck to walk through them, even in groups, and more than a few times I've sprinted, dangerously, on narrow, dangerous tracks when walking by myself at night just because I'm freaked as hell by the sense of fear and dread. And I'm almost 30 and not at all afraid of the dark under normal circumstances. It's not just humans either, I got a new dog. I was walking along a track with him in the middle of the day in bright sunshine and we were maybe one minute from one of these creepy places. Suddenly he stopped dead and he tensed up, stared right down the trail at the creepy area and started growling and barking and backing away. He got to the point where he was pressed up against my legs, tail down. As I was reaching down to touch him he let out a sound that was crossed between a scream and a bark, ran around me and dashed off back the way we'd come. I turned around and started sprinting too. I found him at the house cowering under a bench. Ever since, he's absolutely refused to even go to the start of that track. When I was a kid, 10 to 12 maybe, there was this really old creepy house just round the corner from me. I lived in a fairly nice area and this house was just old and it stained net curtains and a cracked front door and all the works. 
The guy worked irregular shifts so nobody ever really saw him, but other kids would tell stories that they saw him coming home in the early hours with dead animals and bloody knives. Obviously, the rest of us laughed it off as BS. Anyway, one summer we were all bored and decided to sneak past the factories round the back of his house and onto a patch of grass to try to get a look through his back garden. To get there you had to sneak past these buildings, through a bunch of trees and then through a mesh fence that we had to climb over. Not an accessible place at all, and no other way to get to it. Four of us made the trip, and took turns to bunk each other up to get a look over the fence. I went last and could see my other friends were creeped the f out. There were two dead cats hanging from his tree by their tails with a bunch of doll's heads tied up off the branches and swinging around in the breeze. I could just about see into the house and there were no lights on and a few candles lit in a circle on his floor. My friend swears he saw a limp human leg, foot in the doorway but none of the rest of us did. Just as I got a good look, the gate opened and the guy came strolling out, casual as f, with a bloody machete in his hand. We ran, he chased. We all leapt over the mesh fence and then he was gone. Never saw him again. I still have no idea what he was up to and we never told anyone for fear of getting in trouble for what we did. Prior to joining the US Navy, my grandfather took me aside and told me several stories of his time spent in the Navy during World War II. It was his way of ensuring I knew what I was getting into. My grandfather was a weapons technician too, WT2. Aboard the destroyer USS Mori DD-401 from 1942-1945 and manned a 538 caliber cannon. He survived Pearl Harbor, Battle over Tarawa, Battle of Midway and the invasion of Luzon to name a few. With only a small shrapnel wound to his leg in all that time. I'd like to share one of those stories of his though as it just blows my mind to this day. The Mori was escorting an HMAS Australian vessel to Espiritu Santo as Japanese forces were still active in the area and Allied forces were actively attempting to keep Guadalcanal and the Solomons secure after previous weeks of battle with the Japanese forces. The night was clear, with every star in the sky. The wind was so low that you could hear gulls fishing off in the distance and the wakes splashing against the hulls of the ships. The air felt like Hawaii in spring and all you wanted to do was bask in the moonglow. Suddenly, voice radio communications from nearby Allied island bases starting chirping away with information about visual confirmation of enemy subs in the area to the north. Soon after, all on deck order was given and everyone was forced stand ready. A team was assigned light patrol and they began panning around, looking for subs. Not more than two hours goes by with no visual contact made, they are finally given order to stand down and return to shut-eye duty. A few hours before daybreak, contacts from Nendo Island start coming on voice comms warning that potentials are flying around in the area just five miles south of Mori's escort position. Already worried that they may have been targeted by Japanese subs from their bow, they now have to contend with potential aerial assault and everyone is called to stand ready once more. Engines are killed, emergency lights activated and orders given to kill all lights. My grandfather, manning his light is immediately ordered to put that candle out. And pushes the searchlight straight down into the water, turning it off. When they finally stop moving, the crew can hear the low tone humming of several planes passing parallel to their position. Everyone holds their breath and pretends to pretty much not exist. Hoping the enemy doesn't make visual contact with the ships. So for a good long 45 minutes, everyone just sits there. Until they can no longer make audible contact with their enemy forces they hoped would pass. Finally, after almost two hours of nothing, they are given the go-ahead to start the engines and return to the passage. My grandfather flicks his cigarette port side and clicks on his searchlight, still pointing into the water. What he says he saw next aged him and the two others with him a good ten years. Below, where the searchlight sat focused in the water, lay an eyeball the size of a basketball. Sitting there, staring straight back at him from about ten feet underwater. 
The next three seconds lasted minutes in his mind as he watched this silvery disc of an eye look straight through him. Finally, the first of the engines started in what seemed like forever and the beast that it was broke surface for a brief moment in order to dive deep. Even before people acknowledged giant squid existed, before they were ever caught on camera, my grandfather believed because he had seen one within 20 feet of his face. In my eight years of service, I had heard many stories of such things and even own a few teeth pulled from the rubber liner of a ship, but never had any such experiences myself. Adding that experience in lieu of the drama of war and you can get a sense for the true terror it would invoke. My grandfather, who passed away at 93 this July told me this one growing up. Thanks to all that served and thanks for reading. This incident happened to me when I was a boy. My sister, myself and my parents lived in a small trailer out in Connorsville, which is a little ways out from Bardo. My sister and I shared a room with a bunk bed and there was always something kind of off about the room. There was one night when my mother came in while my sister and I had been asleep for probably three or four hours. She woke us both up and said I don't know what it is, but you two need to come to sleep on the floor your dad and mine's room. There's just something not right. So we hated to but we went in there and we fixed the bed on the floor and my mom, she went through the house and checked the locks and everything, and everything was fine. So, we all laid down and I'd say an hour and a half later, there were sounds at the front door and we heard the front door open. My mom was up, I guess, and my dad and sister both were asleep. I was still awake, and we heard pitter-patter, almost sounded like children running in the house. This was about 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning. The way the trailer was set up, you had a door that connected to the hallway and to my parents' bedroom and one into the bathroom. So we heard these things run into the bathroom. You could hear them giggling and then it was just the weirdest sound. It didn't sound like a usual childish giggle. My mom thought she had locked both of the doors that connected to the bathroom and to the hallway. Well, the door that connected to the hallway, it opened slowly and this little short thing peeked its head through. Pardon my French, but it scared the hell out of me. It looked almost like it was wearing a hood on part of its head. It was probably about two and a half to three feet tall. And the face, it was a. The only way I can describe it was it looked almost like a gargoyle. As far as the face, deformed like some of them can actually get. It was grotesque and it just giggled, putting its hand on its mouth almost like, you know, I didn't mean to disturb you. It just stood there for a minute and I'm about to have a panic attack, you know, sitting there, staring at that thing. I couldn't move. I felt like I was in shock. And my mom, she didn't move or say anything, you know. I didn't think she knew I was awake. And after a few minutes it went back in the bathroom with the other ones and shut the door. They were in there to close to daylight, then the door opened and then they went right back outside. I didn't tell my mom what I saw until a couple of days later. I was just too afraid that if I did, they would just come back. And I told her and she told me she saw the same exact thing. Dave asks about what prompted her to go in and get the kids. That night, she had like a feeling like God was telling her to get the kids, bring them in the bedroom, they don't need to be in there. She said that's the only way she can describe it. She said she was laying there asleep and then she just woke up and that feeling just hit her harder than a brick. It felt like it was trying to make its territory known, basically we can come and go anytime we want. It was playing mind games with us, my mom and myself. The feeling I got from it was that it was not good. It was evil. I suddenly awoke, sensing a distinct presence in the bedroom. Initially, I assumed it was my daughter entering the room. Opening my eyes, I glanced towards the side of the bed, where I witnessed an entity standing in front of the wardrobe. It faced me and my sleeping wife, emanating a soft, dull bluish glow throughout its body. The entity possessed human-like characteristics, with a small head featuring a pointed chin and a bald, domed shape. Its thin neck supported a barrel-shaped body, 
while its flexible arms move slowly in a manner reminiscent of Tai Chi movements. The glow surrounding it obscured its facial features, yet it emitted an aura of tranquility. As the entity appeared to gaze towards my daughter's room, it suddenly reacted, turning its head slightly in my direction. With a smooth motion, it extended a hand towards me, its fingers spread wide. From its palm, a pale ball of light gracefully leapt towards me in slow motion, striking me squarely between the eyes. My last memory was that surreal moment, and then I found myself in broad daylight, with the strange entity vanished. I have had disabling migraines for the past 15 years. I realized I was addicted to Xanax and Valium and anything to stop the pain and keep me functioning. Eventually I crashed. I had to stop working, I couldn't read or go into any stores. I lived downtown in big city and wore earplugs to leave my building because the noise was too much. I created a sort of isolation booth for myself. I still more or less live in it. Strangest things I've seen. No. Strangest sensations I think are more like it. I've had moments when I was so starved for human interaction but couldn't handle the stimulation, I would lay in bed holding a body pillow with blackouts drawn, earplugs in, and an eye mask just in case. Sometimes I'd lay for days. Often I didn't have enough cognitive function to feel anything but hunger. I have lain in bed and cried because I couldn't heat up a microwave meal. It is an odd sensation to be hungry, have food available, and be starving. Not anorexic. Incapable. The next is that I don't exist. Time doesn't exist. I forget what month I'm in. I forget what I had for breakfast or if I had breakfast. I've had bills go to collection because they Saturday and Saturday. Not procrastination, but again, my cognitive function drops low enough it's like being a zombie. When I have moments of clarity it's like being dropped in a war zone, knowing you probably don't have time to leave entirely so you strategize what the next best possible foxhole is. Not existing I forget to check my phone. I lose it. I haven't talked to anyone in days. My mind starts sort of swooping. I remember random encounters with strangers that must have been my last human contact. Vividly accounting for the head nods I made as I walked down the street toward the subway. Two drug dealers, I know them, two college kids, bright clothes, a Latina woman standing next to me on the platform. I remember when cognizant that I was staring and she gave me a slight smile and I felt like that was such radiance. So, clearly more than just isolation. But I've learned that my brain is powerful in ways that I try to find interesting rather than frustrating. My experiences make me feel like I'm in a sort of matrix walking through people who felt as real to me as mannequins and stick to such odd schedules. If this didn't make any sense. Sorry. The witness and his cousin were out hunting near Johnson City, Tennessee. And were sitting on the side of the wall of a rather large hollow which consisted of very thick underbrush and lots of evergreen. A larger valley then lead first to a clearing and then on to a supposed old Indian graveyard. All of the sudden they heard the brush in the hollow below rattling and they could tell that whatever was making the sounds was rather large. The main witness was armed with a Ruger 10-22 rifle with approximately 150 rounds of ammo ready to go. Under his night vision scope he could see what appeared to be a man. But upon further inspection he realized that the man was a creature about 7-8 feet tall approximately 450 pounds. It was covered with thick black fur and was slimmer than the popular Bigfoot image, almost skinny with a neck. Also protruding on either side of its head were long tapered horns also black in color. On the top of the head also protruded a horn pointing straight up. All horns were approximately 5 to 6 inch in length and were the same dark color as the creature. The terrified witness emptied a 25 round clip into the creature and then retreated into a nearby cabin about 65 feet away. The next morning they could not find anything except for lots of spent shell casings and bullet holes on a walnut tree. He thought he had struck the creature several times. 
Nearby animals traps had been sprung and all the bait extracted. On a nearby ridge the witnesses located a series of tunnels made up of brush and various sizes of tree limbs, vines and leaves. They thought it could have been the lair of the beast. Afraid they returned home. I was camping in remote East Texas with four other guys. We had hiked for a couple of days and were camped in some pretty thick trees. About 20 yards down a hill was a small river which flowed into a nearby lake, which we were hoping to get to the next day. We had all gone down for sleep but myself and one other guy saw a light from down the hill, a bit to our east. We woke the others, as it looked like people and we were pretty remote. As it got closer we realized it was a base boat with a floodlight coming up the river. People that live somewhere on the lake. It is weird though, because we know they don't live up river anywhere. The river runs into some rough terrain and narrows to the point you couldn't get through with a boat. So they were just coming up the river for no reason at about 1 AM, with a floodlight, scanning both sides of the river. We stay hunkered down and get our one rifle out, just in case. It's creepy, because it really does feel like they're looking for somebody on shore, but we are far enough back to not be seen if we stay laying down. As they get close, we hear a woman's voice talking. It sounds strange, like it's not a conversational way of speaking. As they get close, it sounds like she's reciting something. One guy says it's T.S. Eliot. These are backwoods people reciting T.S. Eliot into the dark forest at one in the morning from a base boat. They came by with this woman just reading this crazy shit while shining the light all over, and some giant duck dynasty looking dude silently driving the boat. Scariest part was that they passed, and never came back down river. We took turns keeping watch, although I didn't really sleep at all, then quietly slipped on down the trail in the morning, trying to hide signs we were there. We ended up cutting really wide around the lake to avoid whoever these crazy redneck poetry fans were. About 10 years ago my family and I were doing some fishing slash four-wheeling in the back country of Colorado. This are as well out of cell phone range and we have been here multiple times before. We usually split up into groups of two, one kid with each parent. We each have a small walkie-talkie to communicate with the other group. My mom and I got out of the jeep and proceed to start fishing in the creek and not three minutes later we get a bear and bear cub by the river we are coming back to pick you up over the radio which is nothing new, we see bears quite often. So my mom and I hightail it back to the road and hop in the jeep. We drive a few miles up river before we decide to head out again and fish. Well. We have our full day of fishing and start to head out of the area and on the way out about two or three feet off of the road is an aspen tree stump that had been chainsawed of at some point. Standing on the stump was the bear cub. Just hanging out playing on its own. We don't see mama bear so we decide to drive by it. Even if we did see her we would just take off down the road. So I have a disposable camera and we stop for a quick moment to take a few pictures of it. I am literally close enough to touch it. We all stare in amazement because we have never seen a bear cub this close. So naturally we develop the pictures. The pictures have the background, the tree stump, the road, everything in perfect focus, but no bear. Everyone in my family saw the bear and we have no idea what happened. We all refer to it as the ghost bear. I lived with my grandparents and my mother. Grandparents were out of town on a trip and my mom had left for work an hour prior at 11 PM. She works graveyard shifts, this was not the first time I'd stayed at home alone but it wasn't a regular thing. You'd think I would have fun with it and make whatever food I want, browse online without being watched, watch whatever on TV and live the dream as a kid with freedom. I'm the opposite. On high alert watching Disney Channel with the phone next to me. Eventually I start to relax and get up to walk to the kitchen. Something is off. My basement door is always shut to avoid cold air coming into the main floor and it's cracked. Me being me, I panic and freeze in my tracks. 
I keep staring at it and see it move back and forth for a few seconds and see it slam shut. I freak the F out and run to get my flats and shoot out the front door. With my keys in the middle of winter, snow falling and it's fairly windy, I ran full speed down the street and around the corner to a family friend's house. I bang on the door and they answer and ask if someone chasing me and I said I don't know but I think someone's in my house. I'm beyond terrified so I called my mom from their phone and explained what happened while crying and struggling to breathe. I stayed over there that night and my mom picked me up when she got off work at around 7 in the morning. We go back to the house and investigate. Nothing weird when we open the door to go downstairs but at the end of the stairs there's a water trail on the floor. Leads to the back door to outside and it's cracked open. It's unlocked but it can't be unlocked from the outside because it's a sliding latch and it didn't seem forced or broken so it must have been left open. There's footprints outside the door that are kind of covered from fresh snow but you can tell someone was there and broke in. My mom didn't call the cops although I wish she would have but she's not one to look into things. I could break my wrist and she'd tell me to ice it and move on. Anyway, we called my grandparents and told them what happened. They were worried and glad I was okay. When they got back my grandpa installed a nice dead bolt on the door. I'm 20 now and I'm still scared in my own apartment at night, but I made sure to get a place with nice security and made friends with the neighbors in case of emergencies. First story is about me heading to my middle school bus stop. I lived about 3 to 4 small blocks away from my stop in a small town. I had loads of energy when I was younger so I would get up at 5.30 am. To get ready for school and once I was finished I would just head to the bus stop to hang out. It's still pretty dark outside once I start walking, 6 30 ish, and since it's a quiet town I was never really scared to walk in the dark. One morning I was on my way there just minding my business, probably following cracks on the sidewalk and I hear grunting. Fast paced, primal grunting. I looked around for a second and made eye contact with one of the homeless men in the area and he charged after me. I was probably 4 feet 11, tiny girl with a ponytail running to my bus stop, which is marked as someone's house, and hid inside one of the bushes. It was still dark but I could make out a body walking around slowly as if he was searching for me. After a few minutes he leaves and I knock on the house's door and tell the owner what happened and he lets me stay inside, neighborhood watch homes or bus stops for kids so I was fine, until other kids get there. Told my mom, wasn't allowed to walk there alone for months. I worked in a gun shop in Houston. One day this guy comes in and asks what is the process to buy a gun if he is not a US citizen. We had to call the BATF to find out. He was a ship captain with a Panamanian passport. He needed a pistol. He had to get a letter from the Panamanian consulate and some export paperwork before he could buy it. We asked him why he would go through all this trouble. Turns out, in the middle of the Atlantic, one of the crewmen woke up the cook and asked him to make some coffee. The cook took offense and chased the guy down and cut off his arm with a machete. The cook would be on the ship on the return trip. Navy sonar technician here. I've heard weird shit all over the world. One time, while doing a deployment to Asia, we were steaming west on our way to Singapore, Urk, and it was about 17 local time, right after chow. Me and a buddy are shooting the shit in sonar control on watch, just me and him down there, and the underwater calm starts chirping. Dolphins, no big deal, they like to ride the bow and make a bunch of noise next to the sonar array. Trust me, you get used to that shit. We continue shooting the shit, talking about stuff back home, what food we miss, that kind of thing. Suddenly we hear this really low grumble, and we actually thought someone was around with the 1MC, the ship's general announcing system, because it sounded like someone was dragging a microphone along a jacket or something. Then we realized it was coming from the underwater comms system, because sometimes a dolphin chirp would cut it out. 
Suddenly the grumble turned into kind of a groan, like it changed inflection. Then we hear a loud whooshing sound, the groan got really loud, then nothing. Both the groan, and more unnerving, the dolphins, were completely quiet. We checked our sensors right after, thinking maybe it was a contact, but you could tell the way the sound was traveling, by the bearing changes, that it was moving erratically. If we hadn't heard it, we would have written off the weird bearings as whales. We went active to try and see if maybe if was a sub and the bearing was something else, but we didn't see it again. That was definitely the weirdest one. As the witness slept in her apartment she suddenly awoke feeling a strange oppressive atmosphere around her. She opened her eyes and saw a humanoid figure bending down over her. The figure was short, about 130 centimeter, and looked intently at the witness. The figure had a grayish-green pale facial complexion. It had large dark pupil-less eyes. Heavy skin folds covered the head and body of the creature. It had what appeared to be a thin beard and appeared to be elderly. A second humanoid now appeared next to the first one. This one was somewhat shorter and appeared younger, both resembled aged gnomes. Both figures then floated back from the bed and vanished. At this point what appeared to be a tennis ball sized sphere of light appeared in their place. The sphere disappeared into the next room and then flew out an open window. I work at sea. Last month we came into dry dock to carry out refit and repairs. Dry dock is when a ship is brought into a lock. The gates closed and all the water pumped out, leaving the ship high and dry on the blocks, thus allowing repairs slash inspections etc. of the underside of the hull. Next to us was an old military frigate being broken down for scrap. She had arrived about two weeks prior to us. Once the frigate was on the blocks and dry, all of the crew left the old girl to her fate. A sad sight, but that's how these things go. Once all the sensitive stuff had been removed, the dock workers were free to go on. The dock foreman, John went on board first with a camera to take pictures of work areas. He took a couple of hundred all in all. This was one of them. He later sent all of the pics to his boss, who upon seeing this one, called John straight away asking who is the guy with the axe at the edge of the camera flash. John had no idea. He never saw anyone. The area where this picture was taken was in a cross alleyway, deep inside the ship. He was going around with a torch and a camera. When he'd go to take a picture, he would turn off the torch, leaving him in total darkness, snap the shot, turn the torch back on and be on his way. Due to the fact that it was a military vessel the police were called. A search was carried out but no one was found. There was one way on and off the ship, and that was by a gangway covered by CCTV. You couldn't jump over the side as it was a 25 meter drop onto concrete. No one was seen to leave the ship after John had taken a photo. I am a skeptic. Maybe it's a trick of the flash reflecting off something, but if you really zoom in you can just make out the FS face, ear, collar of his jacket and the axe in a meaty fist. Now it could be John blowing smoke up my ass, but when he was telling the story he seemed genuinely rattled. And the guy in the pic looks nothing any of the other workers we met at the dock. If someone who is handy with cleaning up pictures, I'd be really interested to see what you can pull out of it. And before anyone asks, I'm not going to name the ship or even where she is, as I'm not sure if I'm supposed to have a picture of the innards of a military vessel. This gave me serious goosebumps. Needless to say, I did not go on board for a look. Eva Trent had fallen asleep when she awoke to a buzzing sound. Opening her eyes she was horrified to find two strange creatures standing on either side of her bed. The entity to her right was about 7-8 feet tall, weighed about 300 pounds, had apparently no clothing and seemed to have either crocodile or snake type skin. The creature to her left was identical in appearance but smaller in height and weight. They seemed to be communicating in a chirping manner. Each of the entity's eyes glowed. 
Eva quickly discovered that she was unable to move. As she stared at the two creatures she found that either one or both were giving her instructions telepathically. The nature of this was seemingly for her to create mentally visual scenes of various kinds and then they proceeded to distort that particular pleasant scene in a perverse manner. Apparently the creatures were intent not only to observe her emotional reaction, but also possibly to feed off the energy that was produced. After a while Eva began to mentally resist the mind manipulation and began to pray earnestly. A short time later she fell back to sleep. The next morning the witness found five of her music tapes grossly distorted as if extreme heat had been applied. However no evidence of fire or odor was present. I was walking on the hill with my two Labradors when, out of nowhere, they went into a frenzy. They ran in circles, growling and snapping at the air, until they eventually collapsed to the ground tails tucked beneath them. Bewildered, I scanned the surroundings and spotted a huge creature at a distance to the side. It appeared translucent, as I could see the grass of the hill through its body, but it was covered in long, charcoal-colored hair. Oddly, it left no trace on the grass. The creature had elongated, glowing red slits for eyes, nose-like holes, thick lips, and stood well over ten feet tall on two legs. Filled with terror, I began to pray, and after a few moments, the creature slowly faded out of sight. I hastily left the hill, with my two dogs whimpering close behind me. I was asleep on the couch at my girlfriend's house, surrounded by pitch black darkness. Suddenly, a dark figure materialized in the hallway. It had a human-like shape and appeared even darker than the surrounding darkness. The figure's head reached the ceiling, slightly bending forward as if constrained by the low height. I lay there, struggling to comprehend what my eyes were witnessing. Attempts to speak proved futile as no words emerged from my mouth. Even my attempts to yell resulted in nothing more than a whisper. The room grew colder as the figure glided forward with an eerie grace. I desperately tried to move, but my body refused to obey, except for an involuntary tremble. The silhouette entered the living room, navigating the walls while keeping its head turned towards me. I followed its movements, transfixed, as it passed behind the stove and through the stovepipe as if nothing obstructed its path. The dark figure drew nearer and nearer to the couch where I lay, now positioned right beside it. Staring at the figure, an overwhelming sense of pure evil engulfed me. My mind went numb, and tears welled up in my eyes. Gradually, laughter echoed in the distance, a malevolent, otherworldly laughter. It grew louder, resembling a gathering of people engaged in a chaotic party with multiple conversations overlapping. Amidst the laughter, I heard a high-pitched woman's voice say. We scared him to death. In that moment, my mind turned to prayer. Summoning all my strength, I cried out, God, help me. Miraculously, the dark apparition began to fade until it vanished completely from my sight. The chilling coldness in the room was replaced by the comforting warmth radiating from the stove. It was late night in late October early November of 1975 I was a 10 year old child. At that time I was going through a late bedwetting phase and remember I was determined to end that embarrassment. I awoke for the second or third night in time to relieve myself and remember being happy and proud that I caught it in time again. As my eyes creaked open slightly I saw movement in the room and at least what I thought were African American kids in my room moving around. I remember thinking that the only thing they could steal of any value was my prized small black and white TV that was on my dresser next to my bed. As you can imagine at this time my heart was pounding through my chest and just wanted them to take the TV and leave. I creaked my eyes open ever so slightly as not to be noticed and was shocked to realize that they weren't afros, which were common at that time, but were whole heads. I can't really express my thoughts of that instant realization when I saw who was really in the room at that time other than how in a nanosecond I went from, 
there's no such things as aliens to oh, my god they're real to what do they want? At that time there was no such things as greys or anything similar to what has been so defined into pop culture today. Being late October early November there was a harvest moon and I had a fairly large picture window in my room which lead to some fair amount of ambient room lighting which I shared with my 5 year old brother who slept in an adjacent bed next to mine. During this event I was creaking my eyes open enough as not to be noticed, laying on my back when I woke up and my bed covers were at my waist. All I wanted was to get my bed cover up to my head so I was ever so slowly and methodically creeping them up during this entire event. As not to be noticed. There was a larger one that stood against the wall directly across from the foot of my bed that just stared at me. There was another knelt down on the opposite side of my brother's bed and what I thought at the time was that he was doing something to his arm. On my head at the time my mind was reeling, my parents room was directly behind me and if I screamed my father would come running in. I remember thinking that the one next to my brother I was taller than and equated him to being in my grade remember I was 10. So if he came over to me my big plan was to jump up and dive on him and scream for my dad. The one against the wall just standing there I remember as being a grade or two older than me and he would probably do something before my dad to get in. I remember thinking I could end the whole debate that are we alone in the universe and the weight of that thought being succumbed to he's killing my brother and not being able to muster the internal strength to do something. My next thought was that if he comes over to me he can't put a needle in me so I started to tear up and that diffused my sight to what was happening in the room. Then the one that was knelt next to my brother got up and came at me, pure horror as my eyes were teared and he rounded my brother's bed and in one motion knelt down on his right knee and in one motion opened his toolkit and kind of flipped and twisted his left wrist and reached in. At that very moment I couldn't hold it anymore and thought needle. And I made audible pre-cry wail. The face that the creature made still haunts me today. Honesty. It's the same face people make when they make a surprise mistake a eek I did something embarrassing facial expression. His mouth was just a slit so when he made that expression his face rippled and wrinkled like a old man. Immediately whatever he was taking out of his box which was a really weird shape then but not now, it was, hexagonal with a diagonal opening and handle, put it back and got up and they marched out. Again another part of this is memory that has crept me out is how they moved like the military and moved or better said marched out of my room. I was shocked and with unreal timing as I looked down the hallway when they passed my parents room two more came out and filed in line which such precision and marched down the hall and all turned down the stairs out of my sight. Again I must stress the timing was if they were one. Needless to say I didn't sleep the rest of the night. My younger brother was fine in the morning, and no one in my family knew anything of the night's event. I lived near a large metropolitan area at the time and our house was the only house surrounded by 260 acres of woods. I only told a handful of people since then and find it very difficult and seriously doubt many of these accounts I read of abductions myself. Ironic isn't it? They were very, very real, and I wish I dreamt it, but I didn't. My impression then and my life of the events of that night is that these beings are cold and indifferent to us, basically they are not our enemies but most certainly aren't our friends. There might be a very good reason our government has kept this secret for so long. Being that I live on the coast of MS, Hate all you want but just know that south of I-10 is nothing like the typical stereotype which that in itself is far off as well, I have been on and around the water my entire life. I have many stories of crazy things and experiences happening while being on the water such as dealing with bad weather, lightning storms, water spouts, high seas, etc., which can be awesomely frightening but the craziest things I have seen have happened while running slash working on fishing charter boats. The one that always sticks with me, and I would also say the most eye-opening, occurred back in 2010 when the Deepwater Horizon oil rig blew and began spewing oil into the Gulf of Mexico. BP, after realizing to a certain extent how vast the spill was, began a program that allowed owners of boats to register and participate in the cleanup of the coastline. Side note, 
Those that were lucky enough to be accepted into the program sometimes took advantage of an awesome opportunity to do something good for the environment and made some serious money from it while at the same time preventing others from getting into the program who would have actually helped. That's somewhat mentioned later but overall is a story for another discussion. So being that the water that I had basically grown up on was being destroyed, I couldn't just sit back and not do anything. I went and got hazmat certified, for this particular instance, among other certifications and through certain contacts I first started working on a 127 feet charter boat. This boat normally will go out to the Chandelure Islands located off the coast of Louisiana for several days slash nights and drop skiffs in the water where clients were guided around the islands to fish. Also I would suggest if anyone has the opportunity to go out to these islands, do it. It's incredible there and the fishing is always on point. Back to story. I was working on this boat for about two weeks and then was transferred to an offshore division that consisted of about 10 to 15 boats. These boats by the way were strictly personal fishing and commercial charter boats with the largest being 57 feet and an average price of around $100,000 and a couple worth well over a $1 million conservatively. Our job was to leave at 6 am and go out and look for oil or any marine life, etc. that may have been impacted by the spill. If we found oil, crude, oil slicks, or anything else out of place or not normal we'd log it, take pictures, and report it. For about a month we were only finding slicks. One day we went out about 120 miles and I'll never forget the sights or smells that day. The crude, we called it mud because that is exactly what it looked like, was everywhere and ridiculously thick, on average 6 inches and in some places up to 1 foot. It was like a super thick putty and to be honest is actually really hard to describe. To put this into perspective though, if you have ever been mud riding or seen a truck get stuck in mud, that's exactly what it was like to these boats but out on the water and a lot worse. This, over time, destroyed the boat's hulls among other things causing significant damage. We were the first group to find the crude and report it coming in that close to shore. Also during this time, we found a life jacket belonging to one of the guys who actually worked on the oil rig. Words honestly cannot describe what that was like. It was a very surreal moment to say the least. So we eventually get back to shore and that's when things start to change. The operation had now shifted to how the hell are we going to clean this up? And what the hell are we going to do with it? It wasn't until this point when we all realized how serious this was, not only for the coastline but for the environment as a whole. The next morning at the dock we noticed that pallets of skimmers and absorbent boom had been dropped off. We were to use the skimmers to round up as much crude as we could, tie off the skimmers into a circle, and place the boom together with the crude inside. That would then be brought to Deacon stations by another division who was assigned that job, these were the shrimp boats. Reminder, our job originally was to just spot, find, take pictures, and report not necessarily handle the oil if all possible. To sum up how that operation went. It was complete shit and that's being nice. It got to the point where instead of myself being the only one who could technically handle the crude on my boat, everyone else working the boats eventually ended up in type suits handling this foreign ass toxic substance in 100 plus degree temperatures for 12 plus hours a day. Side note. Each boat had to have at least one hazmat certified person on board at all times who was supposed to be the only person handling the crude. Also only four people were allowed to work on each boat in our division. We also ended up getting stranded twice by the shrimpers who decided to call a day at lunchtime leaving us with no way to move the crude while also not allowing us to leave because we couldn't just leave the rounded up crude unattended. Yay! Absolutely miserable. Nobody could ever have imagined what we were getting into, and along with that, BP themselves had no idea what they were getting into in their claims of being prepared and were on top of this with all available resources. Blah blah blah. Was completely overshadowed by the fact that they truly did not know how to run and contain an operation of this size and magnitude and that was seen day in and day out. 
This became a day-to-day -day challenge up until the point when my shady-ass boss got caught being greedy charging BP for every miscellaneous thing he bought which caused all his boats to be shut down. His first check was said to be upwards of $450,000 and that's rounding it off. During this time both the employers, the boat owners especially, and employees were making some serious money. What ruined it were the greedy bastards who just couldn't get enough. This is turn caused less boats that were actually doing it for the right reasons from being able to make a change out on the water. In total we worked a little over three months. Going out every day and seeing schools of dead fish, dead sea turtles, and the water that you grew up on literally turned into a mud pit, as that's exactly what it was, was disheartening to say the least. Though all that happened and we dealt with so much, there was one time where we saw that what we were doing might have been helping just a little bit. On one of our last trips, we were about 20 or so miles out past the barrier islands when we could see from a distance what looked like the water boiling and had a red, orange, and yellow color to it. When we got close, we realized it was a school of thousands of redfish and jack creval that stretched as far as we could see and was about 100 or so yards wide. Being in the middle of that, surrounded by these fish, just cannot be described with words. It was incredible and that was the one moment that gave us hope that what we were doing was not a waste and that we were in fact doing something worthwhile. Still to this day, it is the most incredible thing I have seen on the water aside from the oil spill itself. Lastly, just to throw this out there, there is still tons of oil out in the Gulf regardless of what people say. It's just buried in on the sea floor due to the so-called dispersants that BP claimed would break the oil up. It still can be found on the islands, beaches, and marshes. The marine life is just now getting back to normal again in the past two years and it's only going to get better as long as some shit like this don't happen again. There is so much more that I could talk about from this time. Ranging from the oil itself to the things BP supposedly did and did not do. That's all for another day though. Again, sorry for the long post, but this one experience is always the one I come back to when asked about things I have seen on the water and with this thread I felt it should be mentioned. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.